Can you see the laptop in any of the screens? Um, in any meaningful way? No. no? Okay. All right, it looks like we're live. Sweet. All right. Ryan Macbeth, how you doing, brother? Liking, uh, <laughs> or Jared, Cheers. thank you for inviting me. Cheers. Absolutely. It took God six days to create the world. In the seventh, he created American infantry and said, boys, take care of it. It's yours till I get back. Hell yeah. Mm. So getting back. So we were talking a little bit before we went live. We were talking about like where we've been and all that. And mm -hmm. you said you missed Afghanistan. Uh, I wouldn't say I missed it. <laughs> uh, no, I, uh, I went to Egypt and I went to Iraq. And in between, I was an instructor. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where, like, you roll the dice and it just doesn't come up to go. You just don't end up going. And that's kind of the way it is. Uh, you don't get to, you don't necessarily get to pick and choose your deployments. Well, I guess you can. I guess, I'm sure in like in the Marine Corps, you're like, you really want to hop on a deployment. They have a list of. They're waiting for people to volunteer. Yeah, they're waiting yeah. for people yeah. to volunteer. And then you go to get that, that sweet, sweet, uh, you know, deployment uh, money tax free. Tax free. Yes. Yes. A little bit of combat pay. All that stuff. Hazard right. duty. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. I, if I ask about bases you've been to, can I ask about mm -hmm. that? Yeah. You've been yeah. to Pensacola? I have not been to Pensacola. I think that's a Marine thing, a uh, Marine Navy thing. Yeah, Marine and Navy, yeah. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Yeah, so looking at your stream, I thought you were Navy, but it sounds like you were Army. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Army, Army and National Guard side as well, and active duty guard. Um, yeah, it uh, – I spent my – when I joined, I was what's called an 11 Hotel, which was an anti-armor infantryman. Mm -hmm. So basically – when uh, when the Russian horde comes through the fold of gap in Germany, there's Ryan Macbeth with his birth control glasses and his tow missile, ready to take out that Soviet steel and make the world safe for democracy. Twenty years, never fired a single missile. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single missile. <laughs> That's how it often goes. Uh, did you? Uh... So, can you say when you enlisted? Like, yeah, 19, yeah. 1994. 94. 94. How, did you do 20 years? I did 20 years. I got out in uh, tw October of 2014. You know, it, it's been real. It's been fun, but it ain't been real fun. And it was, at the time, I was a, uh, I was what's called a, uh, a first sergeant. Um, you have them in the Marine Corps as well. But mm -hmm. uh, a first sergeant <clears throat> is the hot, for those viewers who don't know, a first sergeant is the highest ranking enlisted soldier in a company a company is mm -hmm. usually between uh 100 120 men marines get up to like 120 or 140 i think for marine corps companies so i was a first sergeant but i was an e7 first sergeant it is the worst job in the army i will tell you that it is the absolute worst job they, they didn't frock you oh you were just holding the billet i was just holding the billet okay. because my first sergeant was at school and oh my god it was like uh, I, now I realize, you know, did you ever wonder, you went like, Man, what the hell are they thinking up at the Puzzle Palace? All what is wrong with the commanders? <laughs> and then I actually go into these meetings, and I'm like, wow, for two hours, we just talked about all the stuff we're not going to do anyway. <laughs> it's, like, it's corporate politics at that point. Like, I, you see the same thing in companies now. Like, once you, you know, you've been out for a while actually worked in the civilian sector yeah. uh and seen like this is the same same deal like mm -hmm. it, everyone down below is saying we need this we need that the things should be changed a little bit here and everyone up there is like yeah we could but why would we a lot of people like to keep it the same people are adverse to change oh god i mean there's two things soldiers hate change and the way things are right now yes right yes <laughs> so like you gotta find that that balance or something i i will tell you i you know, it, it just that just actually struck me. One of the uh, one of the stories. I think I, I, I don't know if I've told this story before, but uh, I think the statute of limitations is has run out on it. So I think I can actually tell this story <clears throat> and uh, talk about change. So I uh, I was once I was in Iraq, and I was burning uh, secret documents. Mm -hmm. Right, and uh, there was this. Uh, I was friends with the guy in the talk, the tactical operations center, and they had a burn barrel. And we were supposed to burn all of our letters. Well, he comes out with a stack of letters that people have put in a little box to go into the burn barrel and burn. Well, some of the letters in there were cards that when you open them up, they play a little song, you know? And he threw them in there, 
and they would ex- the batteries would explode and it'd be like this it was fireworks a little purple <laughs> it's like wow that's really cool i like that that's you know that's pretty interesting so i uh i, I remember I, I told him like hey sorry when when you get more of those cards you keep them and let me know and i'll, I'll come down and burn them with you I mean, look, you're, you're deployed. You don't have a lot of entertainment. Right? There's a lot of stupid things that are done because of bored people mm-hmm. over overseas. Absolutely. It gets better. So then I, I, uh, I come back. I think it was a couple of weeks later. Come back. And I see uh, Sergeant, what was his name? Sergeant Sulia. So I said, hey, Sergeant, you got that? He's like, yeah, I got a bunch of cards. I'm like, oh, yeah. And he's like, hey, why don't you get the burn pile started for me? You know, I got other documents we got to find and burn. I'm like, cool. So. I go out to the burn barrel, and I light, I light, I light up the cigar, and I start lighting, you know, starting the little fire in the burn barrel to get it going, uh-huh. get nice and hot, right? And I start putting the documents in, and then I put in the one of the first card, and it, it explodes, this purple flames coming out. My first sergeant, my first sergeant sees me. He comes out of the, the CP, which is right next to the top. My first sergeant sees me, and goes, "Hey, Sergeant McBeth." You need to be in the designated smoking area. Meanwhile, the burn barrel is like belching <laughs> purple fire. You know, like, like what parallel universe am I in right now? We had a whole stand down because someone threw a fucking trash can in the dumpster. <laughs> what the fuck? And this is a legendary, like everyone, if anyone that I was with is watching this, is the guy comes out and he calls an entire formation after hours. And he says, you don't throw the daggone trash can in the dippity dumpster and that became a the dippity <laughs> don't dumpster you throw the goddamn trash can in out. the dippity dumpster yep yeah i can i can do that i think i can still hey come here hero was that the pejorative come see me test? outside and bring a water source hey double dog yep but <laughs> uh, so i remember standing at that 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 burn barrel thinking to myself like this is freaking crazy right i'm like all right I'm going to fix this because the smoking area was like this rock pile and there was like a 55 gallon drum in this rock. And you, it's like, this is not relaxing, right? No. So I decided to build a smoking gazebo. The center place of all communal activity in the military is the smoking gazebo. So I went to KBR on this particular fob, Kellogg Brown and Root, which was the civilian company that runs all of this contracting on the fob, on the forward operating base. You walk in there, and it's like four fat dudes from Alabama, and then one Iraqi lo- local national is doing all the work, right? Yep. <clears throat> and I roll in there. Now, I was a carpenter. I graduated high school in 93, did carpentry. And I was like, mm, I'd rather shoot missiles, right? So I roll in there with my bill of materials. I'm like, hey, I need all of this wood and, you know, this, that, and the other to build this smoking gazebo. And so these guys from Alabama, these a lot of them claim they were like former master sergeants or you know, whatever. Probably right? snipers too, right? Yeah, right. Master <laughs> sergeant, sniper, you know, space shuttle door gunner, right? I, I swear to God, I'm the only guy who did 20 years and sat in a Humvee and smoked cigarettes. Swear to God. So <clears throat> I, I give them the bill of material. And, well, we can't do that. And, and you, you have to come back and get permission from a mail sale. They talk like Boomhauer, you know? And, and anyway, the forklift's broken. About half a can of dip in their lip. Yeah. yeah. So, like, thank you. I take my bill of materials, and I leave. I go back that night with a private, or a blanket, and a couple of privates. Throw the blanket over the barbed wire. We got the F-150 that we borrowed from the TOC, the Tactical Operations Center. Jump the fence, grab everything we need for building supplies, you know. And, and uh, we managed to get that that uh, we managed to get that smoke and gazebo built in one night. Holy shit! Uh, poured the concrete and everything too. And what's crazy is that since we didn't ask permission to do it, like. It was okay. Like, everybody thought someone else authorized it. Like, the gazebo fairies came out? The at gazebo night. <laughs> fairy came out. But, because, you know, are you going to ask questions? You're going to be like, oh, but no, I have a new gazebo. smoke pit. Yeah, I have a new smoking area, right? So, uh, that, that whole, it, it is crazy how, uh, how you, you look back at, at stories like that, the funny stories, which are like 1% of the 99% 
of all of the other crappy stories mm-hmm. that you had to deal with. You know, stuff like, you know, I got four hours of sleep and they want us to go back on the road again. Or like, hey, um, uh, we think there's bad guys, so just drive down this road. We want to see what happens. But we'll be watching from the bird. You <laughs> yeah, guys we'll go be out. Watching from the, we got your back in the Reaper. To, oh, didn't wasn't expecting that. Well, get us three new Joes in the truck. <laughs> so you said uh, on your mm-hmm. on your profile it says mm-hmm. Intel analyst. Was that during the military time? Did you go down that route, no. or was that after? You know, um, when I um, when I was uh, when I while well, I was in. I started going to school for computer science. Mm-hmm. So when I was in high school, I'm like, man, I want to be a software engineer. Cause like I got into the computer club, you know, <clears throat> and I was, I played sports. I ran track. I've always been a fast runner. I think that's why I was so successful in my military career. Everyone liked me and I could run. Like that's really the basic criteria, you know? So <clears throat> I, uh, I was, I've always been a runner, right? And even now I still run Half marathons. Uh, I ran a marathon, I think, two years ago. I do triathlon. Um, the uh, I'm not as fast as I was. I'm doing like a 12 minute mile, but I'm almost 50. You know, like it, you, you kind of get down there. But uh, so while I was in, I studied computer science, and then while I was in, I got a master's in engineering management, and then. I, I got out and I got a, a degree, a master's in cybersecurity, which is a funny story. Put a pin in that. It's going to be important later. So uh, with the security clearance and with my programming skills, I ended up working for Accenture, uh, Accenture Federal Services, mm-hmm. doing what's called C4ISR, Command Control Communications Intelligence Surveillance. Command Control Communications Computers Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. So we find bad guys, and then we give that information to our client, and then our client uh, – might continue surveillance or they might use more kinetic methods of dealing with the Mm -hmm. problem. So I was doing work for Accenture in the C4ISR space and I loved it. I mean, I, I had a great time. Uh, Accenture is a fantastic company. I love the people I worked with, but you know, when, uh, when the war in Ukraine kicked off and, you know, I started making videos about Intel stuff, uh, that I could talk about. And my channel just took off. I, I was I had a programming channel. I taught people like, hey, here's how to answer job I saw interview it said, like, questions. C sharp channel. C-sharp, I'm like, I haven't yeah. seen the C sharp video. Well, I mean, the early ones were all C sharp, and that was because I interviewed a guy, and I'm like, man, they blackballed him. They blackballed this dude. But look, the average software engineer, like, what? Why do they? Why do they get into software? Because they like computers better than people. Right? They like so now, so how do we interview a software engineer? Let's put them in front of three freaking people, which is the last thing they want to see. Now, I know as a software engineer, you need to communicate, communicate, be able to engage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. However, like these guys, this one particular guy, he just he couldn't, and I knew he knew it. I knew he knew it, but he just couldn't articulate it. I was like, I'm going to start a programming channel. And then uh, the war in Ukraine kicks off. I make two videos about Ukraine. One about why uh, Ukraine hadn't been the victim of any cyber attacks. That's because they have some pretty good cyber defense. Mm -hmm. And the second video was why Russian soldiers were, I'm sorry. The second video was why why Russian tank turrets pop off their hulls. And that's because uh, in a lot of Russian tanks, they keep their magazine of ammunition around the uh, bottom of the turret. So that when that hull is penetrated, all those rounds go straight up. Nothing's really holding that turret in. And it pops right off and goes up into the air. So I made a video about that, and all of a sudden I get 6 million views. No shit. I went from 500,000 subscribers, or 5,000 subscribers to about a little under 100,000 in weeks. Wow. And I was like, okay. And it wasn't until I made a video about butt pillows. Butt pillows? Butt pillows. Why do Russian soldiers wear butt pillows? And there's a funny story about this. I'll give you a coin. All right? I'll, I'll give you... I have my own challenge coin. I will, I will give you a challenge coin. But um, <clears throat> my... Um, I, I was I was doing a... Uh, I, was, I did this whole video on Bitcoin. Like, here's how you actually make a crypto system. Here's how you do proof of work. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. And I did that as a warning to people. Like, hey... When you invest in a cryptocurrency, you don't know what you're getting. And it could be some guy like me who just made it 
in two weeks mm-hmm. in his apartment, right? Well, so I, I, I then made a video about why Russian soldiers wear pillows on their butts. Because if you look at the initial invasion, these Russian soldiers are wearing these like stadium pillows. Do they, only, do they only fire from the sitting position? Is that it? Like You're very, very close. That's, that's the intel guy in you talking. <laughs> so why do they wear butt pillows? Well, many Russian soldiers, <clears throat> they, they ride on the outside of their armored personnel carriers, their BNP, uh, MTBL, <clears throat> MTLD, I'm sorry. They ride on the outside of their vehicles. It's because they're definitely afraid of mines, of a, of a mine strike. So it's dangerous to ride inside. They want to be able to get off fast. So they ride on the outside. It's cold in Russia. What happens when you sit on wet metal in the cold? It frees your ass off. <laughs> you, you, free, you get hemorrhoids. So they, that's why they wear butt pillows. Oh. And <clears throat> so now I have the butt pillow coin, which the front is my face and the rear is my butt. <laughs> Accurate to the hair. <laughs> I had this amazing woman. Uh, I think her name is Shellipede on, uh, on Twitter. It's an amazing uh, artist. Uh, she she it's it's the funniest art thing because she draws like lesbian body modification pornography, you know. But I liked her art it's style. The internet, baby. And I, yeah, I liked her art style, and uh, her name's Chelsea. And uh, so she uh, she drew me. I said, "Can you draw this?" And I, I gave her some money, and she drew my butt accurate to the hair <laughs> on the. On I the look rear forward side. to seeing this coin. <laughs> So yeah, the um, that at that point I was like, I need to do this full time. Uh, that's an incredible bit of growth. Uh, did were you doing videos between like you know you go from that five thousand to that hundred hundred k? Were you still doing additional military videos, or did that one video just skyrocket you to yeah, that? The one video skyrocketed, and then I started doing more military content, and I was also doing uh, programming content as well. And I was like, you know, I do the programming video, I get twelve thousand views. I do the stuff about Intel, I get millions. I'm like, hmm. All this right. is obviously, obviously the direction to go to at that point. It's obvious. And what I realized was that, that nobody's talking about this stuff. You know, like when you go, um, when you watch the news, and I, I'm sure very few reviewers actually sit down and watch the TV news, but if you go watch the evening news, they'll do a two minute segment about how Russia just invaded Ukraine. And they'll show all these turrets lying on the ground. But there's no depth to it. They don't. They don't tell you why the turrets are lying on the ground. And honestly, the news doesn't know either. You know, I did a, a video just recently about the Wall Street, or the New York Times, and how only 033 percent of anybody at the New York Times has served in the military. You have a better chance of getting a straight in poker than finding a veteran who works the New York Times. Now, you, you know, you don't need to be a veteran to write about the military. But think about how many different facets of the New York Times publication touches the military at some point. Global news. Well, I, news. I looked at their health correspondent. That woman's a microbiologist. I looked at their food critic. You know, that, you know, you, you, I like the film critic. They, they probably have a degree in film, right? Yep. <clears throat> so why aren't they hiring people? And the Wall Street Journal wasn't that much better. CNN doesn't have a single journalist who is in the military. Not a single one. None, none of their single, military correspondents or anything. So sometimes they invite people on, but none the of the talking heads. None of the, but the they're talking not heads. the internal yeah. organic ones. And I've done the talking head thing too. I, I get all sorts of crap because I work for Newsmax, and uh, I do. Um, they actually messaged me while I was on the plane, like, hey, can you do a remote? I'm like, I'm on a plane, guys. Sorry. Um, but I guess they did it because of the terrorism incident in um, in uh, Moscow tonight, which was most likely ISIS. <clears throat> uh, no, I, I don't know if you saw it. I did see a New York Times piece come through that said ISIS has claimed uh, claimed responsibility. I did not hear about that, but that's that, that does not surprise me uh-uh. because Russia's, they, they pissed off a lot of people. I mean, for years, as far as like Islamic, you know, extremism, like Russia's been kind of contending with that. What at least since the the nineties, nineties, and Chechens, yeah. and the Chechens wiped. I did a paper on them when I was at Benok. It was Anok. It was Anok. It was a uh, Anok is the army's advanced. Funny, funny thing about that <clears throat> is that they actually called it Mancock, 
<laughs> maneuver <laughs> maneuver advanced non-commissioned officers course I'm like, it's the oh, military <laughs> these people are so christian they don't know how this sounds like you know like like i'm a mainline waspy protestant and i'm like oh okay and these guys well, well welcome to mancock <laughs> So there had I, to be some PFC who was sitting there like, I know what you guys are doing. You don't right. realize it, but I'm, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, some, some 42 alpha who like typed up the letterhead, some, <laughs> you know, the paper pusher guy. I don't know what you call them in the Marine Corps, but <clears throat> maybe. Um, but uh, I wrote a paper about Chechnya. And, you know, what's fascinating about the Caucasus is that in, in most of Russia, military service was something you were supposed to avoid. Like at all costs, you wanted to avoid military service because it sucked. You're away from your family for two years. There's the pra pra practice of Didovchena, the, the rule of the grandfathers, where the second year conscripts haze the first year conscripts. And we're not, th we're not talking about the hazing we did. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, you got your airborne wings, and you punch the airborne wings into your. No, that's all. It's it probably pretty brutal, medieval. <clears throat> it's brutal. Like they're like raping dudes. They're pimping them out to be raped. Holy shit. They're stealing food from them. They're demanding money every day. They're demanding cigarettes. You know, even though these, these guys are getting paid crap, they have to figure out how to buy their, their older conscript cigarettes. It's, it, it was bad. It was bad. And actually, one of the things Ukraine did successfully is they managed to remove that from their army, the hazing, the Soviet-era did of China hazing. And that, I think, has helped contribute to... I'm just being a superior force, at least one for one, man for man. Um, so, mm -hmm. okay, a few a few different things. Like mm -hmm. something I've seen in like the right. So, without like going into like your political leanings or anything, but you work for Newsmax. <clears throat> um, I haven't. I don't follow Newsmax reporting, but I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of, uh, you know, Fox News and others, mm -hmm. um, kind of talking about Ukraine from a very Russia centric perspective, um, giving a lot of favor to Putin. Um, and it sounds like you're pretty educated on, on yeah. Russia. So, I, I mean, if you look at the history of Vladimir Putin, if you look at, you know, what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union, his feelings about mm -hmm. the fall of the Soviet Union, um, what Ukraine means to Russia, mm -hmm. uh, it seems like, again, uh, like Crimea in 2014, and mm -hmm. then we go into Ukraine now. It's a, a, a continuation of Vladimir trying to uh, reassert Russian dominance. Obviously, there is a there is a strategic benefit to having that you know, warm water port on the Black Sea, right? Uh, there is strategic benefit to trying to create that buffer zone uh, around Russia. <clears throat> We're seeing like the the attempts to rebuild the Soviet Union mm -hmm. in some not so subtle way. Um, but why do we see conservatives or even just anyone in general, especially from an American perspective, taking f a favorable view towards Russia um, when I don't know. It's it's kind of ingrained. Like McCarthyism is done and all that yeah. stuff, but we still understand that Russia was, to put it very simply in internet parlance, Russia bad, right? Like, yeah. why is this getting leeway? That's a very good question, and I think <clears throat> I think there's two reasons for that. The first reason is that in some cases it's not. Stephen Ruddy, who uh, is the owner of Newsmax, has written multiple articles on why we need to fund Ukraine. Um, and for the most part, whenever I've come on, um, whenever I've come on Newsmax, I've talked about how cr crucial it is to fund Ukraine, and I've never been given any pushback whatsoever. I think that the difference is that most of what you hear, they're, they're not Americans. If we're talking like the internet, like yes. the, the Twitter accounts and like stuff. How, right? many, how many congressmen have stood up and said, I support Russia? Find me one. Support Russia? Never. Not wanting to fund Ukraine? Well, that's that. <clears throat> that's because where are their constituents getting their information? Their constituents, Russia got to them. And when I sit, when I talk about when I talk about sending money to Ukraine, we're not sending. We're not loading pallets of money. Into no, it's C weapons and gear. Shit, we're not even using. If you it, stuff, we're not even using, and it actually saves us money in the long run. Missiles expire. So I was a tow guy. Right? I was an uh, a anti-tank missile guy, right? Uh, Tube launched, optically tracked, wire guided missile, tow. And these weapons, the fuel in them actually expires. You have to return them to Raytheon 
to demill them the, yeah. if you don't shoot them. Because they're, it's the fuel is dangerous. And they I think they put it in an all nitrogen environment and they have to crack it open. And it costs like as much of the miss as much as the missile to return it. Now, that's what the Raytheon guy told me. Because this Raytheon guy told me, like, hey, anytime you want to shoot, you let us know. Anytime you're doing gunnery, we'll bring you all the missiles you want. It's like they're... going to the range and it's like, uh, we have two thousand rounds. Everyone just start unloading on the uh, targets. One time I, I think they brought like fifty some freaking rounds. I was like by the end of the, I never thought I'd get bored shooting missiles. By the end of the day, we're like, send them down range. We'll throw a trash can in the air. Pull! Right? What's, the, like, what's the load time on it? Sorry to detract real quick. What's the load time on a tow? Load time? As fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, honestly, I, I can't tell you that. I would say less than a minute because if you're talking about a Humvee, uh, the, uh, the dismount has to get out. They go in the back. They take the missile out. They put their back to the back of the Humvee, they kind of push it up like that. You pivot it, you load it in, uh, click in it. I would say probably about 30 seconds. You know, if someone wants me to fire a few hundred rounds of that, I can imagine getting pretty sick of it. Yeah. 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 The so, explosion wears off after a minute. So that's that's kind of, th that reason is number one. That I think a lot of the people who are supporting Russia, they're just, they're internet bots that are getting paid mm -hmm. to do that. And uh, I had a second reason. And I disrupted. <laughs> as to as to why, I know, right? We were talking about Raytheon. We were saying that they they want to take them back because they're expensive. Yeah, but you had asked me, you know, why why people support Russia or why? Oh, the second reason I, I will tell you this: it's I think that the president is not the best communicator. Now, if Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton had been in office, there would have been on on February twenty fourth. There would have been a special message from the president at nine o'clock at night. He would have said, "My fellow Americans, Russian forces have entered Ukraine. Here is why we need to support Ukraine." I don't think people understand. Like the, um, when we can go into this in a little bit if you want to. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think we kind of muddled the fall of the Soviet Union. We were too happy to see that wall fall, mm -hmm. and we didn't do the necessary steps to. Um, I don't know, bring Russia into the international community appropriately in a way that was going to hold them to account, not let them slide back into the ways of the Soviet Union to allow Putin to come into power the way he did. I don't know. I don't think that was our fault. Like, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough to it's tough to kind of change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. And like in a, in a lot of ways, like we, we tried that tactic with China. Where, like, there was this whole theory of if we increase the wealth inside China, then there'll be less corruption. Women will become more educated. They'll have fewer children. They'll. We tried they'll, that with Afghanistan. A lot yeah, of pockets yeah. got lined. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it didn't. It didn't really work. And in China's case, you know, we thought, all right, we're going to drown them in Disney. All right. We're just going to we're going to there's a there's an American inside of every Chinese. And, and in a way, it's kind of right because Chinese was, cap Chinese was capitalist for 5000 years. You know, they've only been communist for what, 75 ish some years? Right? And our media companies are now beholden to them because they're will, uh, unwilling to, to do certain market, things right? that will, yeah. yeah. But I think that's that was kind of the other reason that the, the president, what he should have done, I mean, like, look, while we're dreaming, I want a pony, right? <laughs> like, what the president should have done was sit down and say, my fellow Americans, here's why we need to protect Ukraine. Because Russia, <clears throat> I would have put out a chart, I would have said, look at Russia. See this land border? It extends, I think, 1,600, 2,000 miles-ish. This land border extends 1,600 miles. And there is nothing between Russia, you know, between the, the, the West and Russia. You can, you can drive an army right through there. I think Russia has been invaded 15, 15 times in its history. And, hmm, 14 of those times? It was General Winter that won the battle. I think one of those times it was actually the Russian army. So the Russians have this term, General Winter. You know, the, the whole idea is that you know, when the invading armies come in, they all freeze to death, right? Yeah. You can just hold them off for the winter because everyone knows a Russian man fights best in winter, right? So Russia knows they can't rely on General Winter, but if they take Ukraine, now what do you have? You have the Carpathian Mountains. All right. 
and it goes all the way to Poland. And I think there's the Servetsky, uh, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Look, I'm from New Jersey. English isn't my first language. <laughs> right? So there are mountains in the southeast of Poland. I forget what they're called. I think it starts with an S. I'm sure someone can look that up. Um, but you take Poland after you take Ukraine, and now you only have to defend 200, 300 miles from, uh, from the... Oh my God! I forget the name of the sea. What's the sea above Poland? The Baltic Sea. I think so. Yeah, Baltic Sea, all the way down to those mountains. So that's the plan. It's Ukraine, then Poland, and once they go into Poland, well, I don't know if you're still an IRR, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm have to work on that PFT. Yeah, you're gonna have to. Well, what's funny is I, I actually, uh, my arm was actually cut off and. and amputated and reattached holy shit so i don't know if they can i mean i might end up being a trainer or something like that. i mean that. you know with the intel background you can just sit at, if we're at the war with russia i assume that it's all hands on deck and they'll take you know they'll take any well i don't know i'm pretty weak in this arm and i can't actually extend it all the way and that was my um <clears throat> so i did not get hurt in in the army i uh got hurt training for a triathlon of all things oh and the the funny story about that one is how so i was um i was psyched now back when when i first joined it's 1994 young private Macbeth down at fort benning now fort moore georgia <clears throat> you know and so we're, we're our drill sergeant the senior drill sergeant his name is sergeant ricks and you to talk like this okay pirates today we gonna play a little game i likes to call it kill the pirate front leaning rest position <laughs> so <clears throat> this guy I mean, jacked just just freaking jack black dude tower power right airborne air assault pathfinder he had been in grenada he had been in uh, panama somehow he missed the gulf war was he a ranger <clears throat> uh i actually don't i don't think he was a ranger but just 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 squared away dude mm -hmm. you know what he was a ranger because he was in the best ranger competition twice twice so this guy, he was just he was just an amazing, amazing specimen, amazing person. And I remember he used to make me carry around a book of Shakespeare's plays. I think it was Hamlet, you know. And so <clears throat> I guess he got at a community college or something. When he found out my name is Macbeth, he gave me this this little paperback book of Shakespeare's plays. And whenever we were like standing in line for chow. <clears throat> or at the rifle range or waiting to, you know, waiting for ammo. They'd go, Macbeth, Macbeth, where Macbeth at? I want to hear a sonnet. So <clears throat> I'd have to run out and get my book out. You know, uh, by the twitching of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. Real strong. No, do it the right way with the voices, Macbeth. <laughs> you know, I'd have to do the whole freaking play. And he'd be there, ah, 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 Macbeth, you so funny, ah, 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 I don't like white people, but I make an exception for you, <laughs> ah, ah, ah. So, you know, naturally, we all, like, worship this guy, right? Of course. And um, he, uh, he, uh, I remember this one time we had a, an ND, a negligent discharge. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this one dude... Yeah, he was turning his rifle, and somehow I guess the drill sergeant's missed checking a rifle. Oh! And before you turn your weapon in, you pull the trigger. And yeah. it was just a blank round because we had been practicing sports: slap, pull, observe, release, tap, shoot. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, the weapon went off, and they smoked us. It was torture. It was oh. getting to be. It was. I think they smoked us for like two hours straight. And smoking, it's not like that. It's not the good kind of smoking. Is this was. Um, you're yeah, your they were making us in. do physical yeah. exercises. <laughs> Just so your viewers know what that means. So I remember thinking, like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to freaking quit. I can't do this. I'm going to quit. I was ready to stand up and just say, I refuse this, to Was this boot camp? This, oh, well, we call it basic, basic training. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember thinking, like, man, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I don't know if he saw me or, or he was, like, you know, just saying this to everyone. But he comes up to me, and he puts that round brown, like a millimeter, in front of my face. And he goes, Pivot McBet, never give up the will to live. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't. I had a different. Uh, oh. So I was, <clears throat> I was in a, 
I was in boot camp and we just mm-hmm. did the gas chamber and I came back and I, I did fine in the gas chamber. I didn't throw up my, you know, mm-hmm. tons of people sitting outside. They, uh, for those who've never been to boot camp, you, um, you go in, you do the gas chamber. They'll make you take your mask off, put it back on to yeah. show you that, Hey, it, it works <clears throat> fucking chill out. Right. Mm-hmm. I do all, I do fine there. There are some people throwing up in the barrels <clears throat> outside. Um, and we get back and, you know, we're, we're doing some cleanup and all that stuff. It's like one of the rare moments of like, hey, just shit's happening and you're not completely under control. And I'm standing outside the senior drill instructor's office mm-hmm. and my ass itches. And I, I'm like, I've got CS gas in my ass. So I'm going to I'm going to scratch it real quick. <laughs> I haven't gone to the shower yet. And so I, I give it a scratch and I'm thinking like we're dudes, right? Mm-hmm. I can scratch my ass. So I give it a, a real good deep scratch. And yeah. the first sergeant walks in because there's fucking doors right there. Mm-hmm. He walks in. And I pop to attention, like mm-hmm. good recruit. And I say, sir, good morning, sir. And then uh, he goes in and I pop back to scratching my ass. Two seconds later, all three fucking drill instructors come out and start fucking tearing me apart. The kill hat takes me to the fucking quarter deck. It's it, it's a sweat session. We're doing the mountain climbers. We're mm-hmm. doing the fucking, uh, you know, jumping jacks, all that shit. And that's that was my day at boot camp where I was like, this doesn't make sense to me. I was scratching my ass. What the fuck is happening? And, uh, and I start to break a little bit and I fucking, uh, we get to, we go to do the Marine Corps martial arts training <clears throat> mm-hmm. and we're, we're sitting there and I start to sniffle a little bit and I'm like, and I'm holding it and I'm fighting it. Mm-hmm. And this fucking dude, he sees me, he knows, and he comes up and he says, that's right. You don't belong here. And I was literally fucking thinking mm-hmm. that I was like, I do not belong here. And he's like, you don't belong here. So yeah, go ahead. Fucking leave. Fucking do it. And didn't break again after that. Hmm. I was like, fuck this. <clears throat> fuck him. Like I got over myself and I fucking went through, but like totally different experience. Your guy was like encouraging. Our guys were yeah. like, fucking kill yourself. I, when I became a trainer, like I, I, I wasn't a yeller. I think I yelled like twice. I think it was safety. So like if you point a weapon the wrong way, like it's like, I'm, get your yeah. fucking head on straight. I'm here, you. Yeah, I can do that. But, um, <clears throat> fast forward 25 years later, I was doing, it was on my triathlon bike. I'm trained for this triathlon. It's five, five in the morning. You know, I'm on this trail, it's dark, and I take a turn a little too fast, and the bike goes off the trail, and my, my arm hits this, like, light pole, and my arm is amputated. I mean, it's hanging off by a couple, of, like, pieces, right? What was the pain like in that moment? Like, could you feel no it? Pain. There was, so, there was total shock. Like... And I was like, <clears throat> never give up the wheel to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, like, I, I was like, all right. I got 15 seconds to get a tourniquet on. I had my bike wrench. I had my bike jacket. I made a tourniquet. That's when the pain started. And then I was like, all right, if I stay here, I mean, maybe a jogger will come by. I couldn't get a signal on my cell phone. Like, maybe a jogger will come I later learned, like, even if you can't get a signal, you can still get, you can a still call. get 911. I didn't know that. So I was like, all right, I will... If I wait here, I'm gonna die. And I'll tell you, you know, I did. I I used to drive Route Irish, which is the airport road. You know, seven point five seven point five miles from the airport to Baghdad, kind of a green zone. <clears throat> wait, I'm, I'm sorry, you were overseas during this? Oh no, 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 no. this was this oh, okay. Was, I, I okay. was just saying, like, I I I did I did Iraq. I never got a scratch, not even a paper cut. You know, and I come home and I freaking get into a bike accident and i'm thinking like i i want to live like i wanted to live more than ever you know like more than i ever wanted anything so i decided well if i stay here i'm going to die because maybe a jogger will come by maybe they won't or another cyclist so i picked up my arm and i walked every hundred yards or so i'd, I'd kind of put my arm in where my my um <clears throat> my leg was and kind of squeeze on it with my body and I would try my cell phone. Eventually I got an ambulance called 911 Then they couldn't find me. I had to walk to the ambulance and they, <clears throat> and actually what's funny is that they, they, I swear to God, they hit every bump on the way to the hospital. <laughs> they took me to <laughs> suburban hospital in Maryland. And so I'm, I'm in, I'm in bed in this bed and my, my arm is packed with, stuff and they take it off because um uh 
the nursing students are coming. So I guess the head nurse or the training nurse or whatever brings these nursing students in because I guess they don't get a lot of traumatic amputations. So they're explaining like they're they're coming in and they're like looking at it and pointing and stuff like that, <laughs> you know. And this one girl, she comes in and she goes, oh, like that, you know. And and she goes, how did you do this? And I told her. And she goes, oh, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And I said, never give up the wheel to live. <laughs> like, I'm some crazy person, right? Like, <laughs> they probably look at you out of your fucking mind like, oh, he's in shock. He, he doesn't know what he's doing. It would have been nice to get drugs or something. I, I actually, I realized, like, that's that's when I realized, like, uh, I don't think uh, drugs work on me. Like, um, like uh, painkillers? No. And I, I've actually wondered if that's a thing. Like, what, I, I've heard that marathoners and triathletes handle pain differently. Like, we just have a different tolerance for pain. I, yeah. And I, I actually spoke about it because my doctor wrote me a prescription for uh, narcotics. Mm-hmm. Like, the, like, I forget the exact name of it. And it didn't do a damn thing. You know, it didn't do anything. And um, what did work was the drip in the hospital but like the pills didn't work and i'm like how the hell are these addictive they don't freaking work and i just i actually asked the doctor i said could i be like immune or resistant to painkillers he says yeah some people that can happen to some people so i guess my body is just different i mean that makes sense i so i was never a runner like mm-hmm. that was my worst so for what was your run time do you remember your mile uh at least a seven uh, seven minute mile six and a half when i was younger and the, it slides oh course. right like yeah. it, it gets <clears throat> so probably six and a half when i started yeah i mean i used to be that guy I, I did a triathlon my first triathlon was actually in egypt no shit yeah my uh my first sergeant you know he was like hey uh so the mission in egypt it's called the mfo multinational force observer and um the the mission was uh, we sit on the border between Egypt and Israel, and we enforce the peace treaty that was signed back in 1979. So I roll in. Uh, to, I roll into the CP one day to do something. And my first sergeant sees me. He goes, hey, Sergeant McBeth, you need to represent us at the MFO triathlon. Oh, Roger, first sergeant, when is that? Tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> like, Roger. Um, <clears throat> I'd never done a triathlon. He said, you know how to swim? Like, yes, first sergeant. So, All right. So, uh, you know, uh, grab some stuff, uh, be back here in an hour where there's a van going up to North Camp. So the it basically every year, I think it was on the anniversary of the Multinational Force and Observers, they have MFO Day. Mm-hmm. And it, what's really neat about the MFO is that multiple, I think it was 14 different nations are in it, Norway, Japan, uh, Italy, the French, Hungarians, Uruguayans, uh, Fijians, like Fiji has a military, yeah, they have three battalions. <laughs> one is in Lebanon, one is at home, and one is in the MFO. One, in, we'll have to Lebanon. get to that. Yeah, they're, they're uh, doing peacekeeping missions. Oh shit! Mm-hmm. So, my first sergeant told me, like, all right, <clears throat> he, he, I was like, hey, first sergeant, I don't have a bike. He's like, don't, don't worry about it, I got you. So he comes by, he, and I come back, I pack up my stuff, come back in an hour. He rolls in with this bike that was borrowed from a delivery man that like delivers food on the on the fob because th- there were bars mm-hmm. there and you could like order food so he he comes in the bike has a basket and a bell and a fixed gear. <laughs> <clears throat> how many speed was it one speed one speed <laughs> so all right, all right we go to north camp and that night i uh they billet us in this barracks that was right across from the new zealanders the mm-hmm. new zealand contingent was there too I go to the New Zealand contention because they have a bar. I think I'll have a beer and then I go to bed. That way I have, you know, I'm good for. When they found out I was doing the triathlon, I didn't buy a single beer all night. I think and I was. And you had there. more than one. I had more than one. I think I drank till two in the morning. <clears throat> and then, like, I got two hours sleep and I had to be up at four in the morning. Found out later, like, I think they, they, I was like the ringer. Like, <laughs> or the, the, you know, like, let's get this guy. Because I told him, like, oh, yeah, well, I've done the Army 10 miler. I've done, and I think they were, like, trying to knock you trying down. Trying to knock me down a little bit. <laughs> I didn't buy a single drink that night. It was crafty New Zealanders. So we start the race. And the swim, I'm in, like, the middle of the pack. I'm an okay swimmer. You know, I, I got to the end. And I get on the bike. And I start pedaling, you know, ding, ding, get out of my way. You know, my little my little delivery bike with the basket. Meanwhile, 
the French and the Italians are <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> they have like racing bikes. I found out later that you know the uh, this was like a major event for some countries, and they actually would send people to the MFO just to compete. In the oh, MFO you're, get, you're getting sent to Egypt just to fucking win us this race. Yeah, I mean, you might be working in the in the talk, right? Mm-hmm. But you're training for the race. You know, to bring the victory back to Colombia, right? The Colombians were there too. Uh, and I'll tell you, the Colombians are some stone cold killers, dude. I would Colombia is probably has some of the best light infantry in the world. Yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So, I swear, like one French guy like flicked his cigarette at me as he passed me. You know, smoking while and, riding, <laughs> and you know, I'm on a little bike, you know, and and. We finished the bike part of the triathlon. Now we got to run. I did okay during the run, but everyone was so far ahead of me because they all had like racing bikes or just hybrids that were better, mm-hmm. you know, than my little my little fixed gear bike. Uh, as I approach, like I, I I see them put the tape up, and I was like, "What the, did I did I just like go into a wormhole? How am I first? Like, I look behind me. I'm like, is there a why are they putting the tape up? So I cross the finish line, put my hands up in the air like that. They take my picture as I'm crossing the finish line. I was so far behind everyone. <laughs> the photographer had missed. For some reason, they just missed the guy crossing the finish line. <laughs> I was so far behind that they put the tape up again so the photographer could get a picture. Of someone crossing the finish line to put in the post newspaper. So you got, uh, hey. I came in 40th out of 40, dead last. The next day, the first sergeant comes to pick me up. <clears throat> you know, I, I think it was two days later. I have a, I have a co- you know, I have copy of the post newspaper. He's like, So how'd you do? Beth, did you, did you come in first? Show him the post newspaper. <laughs> I got a coin. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, first sergeants can't read, so it's all right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, what's, what's funny is, like, you're absolutely right. For, I know once me and a couple other NCOs are playing Scrabble, first sergeant comes by, he's like, hey, uh, can I play, guys? I'm like, I don't know, Top, look at the size of that word. Oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, good clean one. Yeah, yeah, I, and actually, from what I understand, like the purpose of a first sergeant back during like the Civil War was that they could read. Like that was part of the criteria because you were the guy who was doing the roles and who was mm-hmm. on sick call and so on. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, I could tell stories all night. I'm sure you've got questions <laughs> or your viewers. I, 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 I have tons of questions. I mean, my viewers, you know, they normally watch me cook. That's my main, really? my main content. Yeah. That's me. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, I have, I have tons of questions. Okay. So, like, I mean. Um, uh, so in your, in your job, like, I mean, we can talk about Afghanistan. I know you were, you didn't make it on, but no. like, I assume that with your job now and all that stuff, you've been pretty, uh, well read, obviously, you know, you didn't fight the Russians, but you know, a decent amount about, uh, that let's two things real mm-hmm. quick. Fiji, what is Fiji doing in Lebanon? Did you say? Yeah. Fiji, they, uh, unless I'm incorrect, <clears throat> but Fiji has three infantry battalions and I believe they are, they are technically reserve battalions. So uh, they get deployed to uh, Lebanon, and then they come home, and then they get deployed to the MFO, and they come home, and they farm their little you know, mangoes or whatever they grow in Fiji. But that's what the Fijians said, yeah. That no they, shit. Three battalions. And they, they you know, they, they, one, of their, one of their drugs of choice is kava. I've never <clears throat> done kava. Well, I have. <laughs> <laughs> and it it looks like dirty dish water. And it just made my <laughs> mouth numb. So that actually makes me wonder. I've never done drugs, so no shit. it it just. It, and I'm it, listening. I just got to. No, 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 no. I've never, and I think that uh, maybe like because that at, at the MFO games uh, mm-hmm. they don't let the Fijians have kava, which it's like a root or something that they 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 cook, and I guess it's like a natural stimulant or mm-hmm. something. They don't let them have it at their uh, at their co- at their cops at their combat outposts, but they can have it when they come back. Okay, and they they were letting s- soldiers have it, like and it, you, it, it's like they 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 put this root in like dirty dishwater in a, in like a, a, a plastic bucket, <clears throat> and you just drink out of the plastic bucket, this communal plastic bucket. 
It sounds fucking hate. It's like the grog at the Met. Yeah, you know, like the, oh, try yeah. to keep me away from the grog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, oh, this is a punishment. All right. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, no. oh no, stop. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was actually, I, I was always that guy who was like, let's, let's freaking, oh, we got a dining in, let's freaking go. So we had a, <laughs> we had a dining in in Iraq, mm. and um, really. Uh, yeah, and uh, it was very nice. I mean, like a nice little reprieve from you know, hmm. uh, like just you know, not that I was in any shit, and I was Intel Bubba sitting in a mm. in a you know hooch all the time, but um, so we did a mess night and <laughs> we, you know helped plan it and all that stuff. But I I went to war, yeah. um, so I I put like, I printed off a bunch of pirate flags on the printer and I stuck them under people's fucking seats and uh, I stood up and I said, uh, Mr. Vice, request permission to speak to the president of the mess. Mm -hmm. And he says, permission granted, I speak to the president. I say, president of the mess, I have reason to believe that there are traitors amongst us. And I believe if you check under the flags of Sergeant so-and-so, Lieutenant so-and-so, and and Corporal so-and-so, you will find uh, evidence of their treachery. And then he says, gentlemen, lift your chairs, and they have all that stuff under them. And then, uh, and then, of course, you know, they have to you know, do stupid shit because we don't have grog out there. Mm-hmm. But my favorite one was I put a uh, – you're not allowed to bring food, outside food, into the mess mm-hmm. as far as the Marine rules go of the mess. And so I stuck a can of Spam under my staff sergeant's uh, oh. chair, and I said, uh, Mr. President, I have reason to believe that Staff Sergeant so-and-so has uh, smuggled food into this here mess, and he, I believe you will find the evidence under the chair. Pulls out, and I'm not talking like one of those tiny Dollar General cans of spam. I'm talking the big fucker mm-hmm. making a meal for your whole family. And he pulls it out. He had to eat the entire fucking can. I, I'll tell you something. I like spam. Mm. <laughs> Spam's amazing. Don't Fry that I, stuff. I, for me, that's hell yes. <clears throat> and I, I don't know if that's a processed food or not because you look at it, it just says ham. Ingredients, ham. ham. And salt. That's, like, it. that's it. It's just ground up into this beautiful, delicious paste that you just cut it up and you fry it. Dude, a spam sandwich, an egg. Oh, yes, please. The I think wines I have, do it I have right. two cans. I have two cans in my house right now of spam. I, it's like my emergency. Like if I, if I don't think. <laughs> so every day for breakfast, I have like two pieces of bacon, sometimes three. It depends. Like when I'm reaching in for the bacon, if I get three, then oh, I, oops, you know, yeah, oops, yeah. So I got three. And two eggs and toast and some orange juice. That's my breakfast. And usually I eat that around twelve. I normally fast until twelve. So. Yeah, the spam is there in case like I'm at that point where like I use some bacon on a uh, on a hamburger. Mm-hmm. You know, oh crap! I don't have bacon. I don't want to go to the store. Well, emergency spam. Oh no! Right. Yeah, <laughs> well, I think this stuff's delicious. Dude, it's fucking amazing. But um, all right, question. So yes, I saw a tweet from you uh, today talking about arming the Palestinians mm-hmm. um to go to war with Hamas, right? To out them. Um, I think a concern that people have is mm-hmm. that. If they do that, they could then turn towards Israel uh, with a much better armed force. Um, so I guess what, what are your – I haven't seen – I don't know if you've done a video on this at all, but I, <clears throat> I haven't seen it. So I, I guess what are your thoughts on that? I have done a video on it, and I think that's kind of the same logic as people who don't let – who don't like the idea of people conceal carrying, you know, because like, well, if you have an active shooter who's shooting people, how are they going to – police gonna know that the concealed carry guy is the good guy as as if like the guy who's shooting indiscriminately is somehow better <laughs> than the guy <laughs> who is taking careful aim shots at the active shooter uh i my my argument for what i call the sons of palestine and i i've often said i am more pro-palestine than hamas uh, I think these people, they deserve, they, they got, are you familiar with the whole story of, of like these people? And yeah, like no, I, the, so the I short have, shift they got, I have, hmm, I've shaft. caught, I, I've caught a lot of hell from, mm-hmm. um, the community that you're going to engage with tomorrow because I'm very pro-Palestine, Yeah, but I'm, that doesn't mean you're anti the existence of Israel just to be pro-Palestine. It just means that you have empathy and possibly a historic understanding of what these people have gone through. So they, um, some of these guys still have keys, like it to the fucking a houses. They're the yes. house that they were kicked out of. Now that doesn't mean you can blow other people up. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So the thought here is that if we arm these dudes, we're going to arm the dudes who don't have a criminal record. And Israel has their biometrics, especially if they've crossed into. Israel. I don't think what every kid in the last like twenty years is in a database for. Israel. I'm not aware of that, but. You know, Israel would have to somehow get that information. You know, if, if they never enter Israel, then I don't know how they're getting that information. 
unless they're stealing it from the hospital. But you're not taking biometrics from a baby. No, right? no. So well, they have biometrics on people. And, like, let's let's get the ones who are like, you know what? I'm sick of Hamas. I'm sick of living like this. Gaza could be a freaking paradise. What is it? Ha- it has two things that a lot of countries in the Middle East and Africa don't have. A steady access to power and steady access to water. At least they used to. They're right next to Israel. They get their power from Israel. They get their water from Israel. They have nice beaches. And everyone wants to be an engineer. They got some good engineers there. I mean, they're able to dig up freaking drain the pipes and turn are, them into missiles. The like, tunnel systems are well, shoot, incredible from what I've seen. Let's the get schematics. you working for Apple. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, let's have you design a freaking iPhone. It's obvious you're some good engineers, right? <clears throat> so if we can get the ones who want to fight and the ones who they might not like Israel, but like, look, where are we? Where are we right now? We're in Florida. Hell yeah, we are. Do you know what Andrew Jackson did to the Seminole Indians? I sure do. <clears throat> tears. And I'm sure you feel horrible about it, but Absolutely. then you're like, you know, it is nice. It doesn't snow. <laughs> right. So. Look, we're not giving the Seminoles Florida back, right? That's just that's just the way it is. It sucks. But if we can say to the Palestinians, look, take back the West Bank, capture or kill every single Hamas fighter, we're going to give you that country. <clears throat> you establish your own police force. We'll support it. Hook up water, electricity. You have all these engineers from, I think there's, there's several colleges there. Everyone wants to be an engineer. And, like, you go and you make this country and you make it work. And I, I you, you could say, well, they might. T- Look, they're not taking Israel. It's not happening. No. Like, and, and, it's just, and, there's, you know? and there's no part of me that wants them to. Like, <clears throat> like they're not taking Israel. There's no river to the sea that's going to happen. And I don't want that. What I no. do, what I personally want is a contiguous extension of Gaza to the West Bank. I want them to have Gaza. And that's it. I yeah, think I don't that know how you do that. How, unfortunately, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not the. I'm not I, a cartographer. Yeah, but I think the uh, the issue is that like you have a hostile nation like to each other, right? Um, Israel, you you know there are it's a well documented like uh, abusive people that come in and out of West Bank and Gaza that do have the ability to <clears> do so. The very few. Um, so it's like I want something that doesn't. I want a few things. I want one that makes them able to get water, without the connection to Israel. I want them to be able to travel to the West Bank without it. Even if it's a slender strip, I want them to have that autonomy to do so. That's the biggest that thing. There might be a way to do that, like create the A zone, the B zone, and the C zone like they have in the West Bank, like saying, like, look, if you want to travel to the West Bank, you have to stay on this highway. You have to build that highway. And if <clears throat> maybe you have, I don't know, border guard stations. So your passport is checked. If you want to come off that highway, I don't know. But I want peace, too. That That's the other option. thing. I want it to be where it isn't hostile. I want it to be where it's accepted that this is the status quo now, where Gaza and pa- the West Bank are reconnected, and then Palestine is created and recognized by the last th- eight holdouts that yeah. refuse to do so. I, I think an issue I have, so like I've, I've been, uh, you know, I went, I was in the war in Afghanistan Mm -hmm. a couple times. Um, You know, I've been reading more about the parts of it that I wasn't involved in directly. Mm -hmm. Um, One of our biggest mistakes was not bringing the Taliban into the fold as far as the post-conquer discussions. So the Bonn Conference, right? Mm -hmm. One of of the most, I guess, widely accepted mistakes that that was made by the international community was not involving the Taliban. And so the Taliban then got to do whatever it did, you know, seek refuge in Pakistan, which... You know what? I, I have some mixed feelings on the uh, the sovereignty of nations when it comes to Pakistan because you know uh, they tried to play both. Sides. They played both sides. They were very you know in the '90s um, they were very pro uh, Taliban. They saw them as an ally when it came to the war in India. Would you like some fresh ice? Oh, that would be nice. Thank yeah, you. we're gonna take a break for one second. You'll still be on camera, but I'm gonna grab you ice <laughs> myself as well. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>
sir. Thank you. So where was I? Uh, Taliban. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know the oh the ISI. Oh fuck, I could bitch about them forever. Like it's one of those things we needed them. Same with Syria, right? Like there's a whole bunch of fuckery that happens in the late '80s and through the '90s when it comes to you know those two nations in our relations. We fucked up too. We were being warned. There was a guy I can't remember his name. Um, there was one of the, the, you know, the, I don't know if he was the station chief or if he was the, uh, I think he was the station chief at the time, um, in the early nineties. Like we constantly had warnings of the threat of Islamic extremists because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand that like the Taliban wasn't fucking suicide bombing us right away. That was something that came from the Arabs. That was something imported from Iraq later in the phase, in the later phases of the war, like 2004 to yeah, 2005. Yeah, that's, yeah. And then in but as far as like the the islamic militancy the extremism you know that was coming from osama bin laden and the the facilitation of foreign fighters the syrian fighters coming in the saudi fighters coming in um into afghanistan into afghanistan well, during, during, during the, the war in the 80s yeah in the 80s yes <clears throat> i know the chechens tried to go to afghanistan the freaking the the afghans murdered them yeah no no it was the uh it was the syrians and the and the saudis they coming just want in. to be left alone <laughs> You know, like, no, they that's do. It. They just want but, to be left alone. But during the war in the eighties, they they were like, "Yes, please, like, <clears throat> yeah. come help us." They were like, "Yes, you can fight, you know, with us." And and you know, Osama and others are mm -hmm. are facilitating, you know, millions of dollars to help the the mujahideen during that time. Um, but there were threats, and there were even the Taliban was concerned. Like, the, as when they came to power in the nineties, they were like, well, "We've got, we've got to fucking deal with this issue," and they kind of felt beholden to them, not because of what they did, but more because of the threat they posed. And then you have Mullah Omar, who was, um, you know, a, a zealot of the highest order. Um, but even he had his reservations about Osama. And there were multiple times where he went to the Saudis. But there was also the religious conviction concern about, like, you know, it's a very sacred thing for the Pashtun culture where you, they're our guests and we yeah, must protect right. them. Yep. Exactly. And, and it's, it's kind of, you ever watch Game of Thrones? Uh, I am familiar with, yeah. It, it's like, you know, the, uh, the, uh, um, I there, there was a word for it. I forget the, the salt name and the, the bread, though. Yeah, when, when yeah. They, at the red wedding, and they do that like that betrayal. You know, eventually leads to uh, Lord Fuckwitz. I can't remember his name. His death, but like that that kind of thing in, in Pashtun culture is very serious. Yeah. And um, I don't know. It, obviously, complex situation, right? But like not in the way that people hand wave. Like, oh, it's a complex situation. We don't know what to do. No, we can understand like what they were going through at the time. But the whole point being is that the United States. Um, was being warned by our own diplomats and our own CIA analysts and people on the ground saying this is a problem. And there were so many people suppressing it, not wanting to deal with it. We, One of the reasons, two reasons, that uh, Pakistan had issues with us is one, is that once they were no longer of use to us, we started to fucking enforce the Pressler Agreement, where or the Pressler Act. And so it was like, oh, you guys built nukes, fuck you, kind of thing, right? Um, but we were okay ignoring that. Bush was okay ignoring that. Reagan was okay ignoring that. Um, for those who don't know, like uh, under the Pressler Act, you have to validate every year that you know that Iran or that uh, that uh, Pakistan hasn't like expanded their nuclear pro progress as mm -hmm. far as to nuclear arms. <clears throat> we were fine to ignore that and say no, they haven't until we didn't need them anymore, and they felt betrayed and abandoned by that. So then they had to deal with the radical extremism on their border. Mm -hmm. um, and then well, I lost my train of thought. Second, the second one was uh, it was the Pressler, and uh, it was the fact that we just disengaged. Absolutely, and they had to deal with the problem. But they also were using that in Kashmir. They were using the extremists to uh, you know uh, terrorize the Indians uh, when it came to Kashmir. So you know, yeah, they were playing both sides. <clears throat> That'll be bad if it ever kicks off. It would. Uh, there were a couple times where <laughs> we were pretty concerned that it was. Yeah, that um, <clears throat> Kashmir is weird, man. That uh, that is not a place I would want to fight. No, I My... do love Kashmir sweaters though. They're very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, you know, and and what's kind of scary is that India and Pakistan both have modern, capable armies. Yes, volunteer forces that know how to fight, and. Yeah, you know, the India has a lot more troops than Pakistan, but you know, Pakistan and India both have nuclear weapons. I, I don't know if I can see them going to war over Kashmir, but that has been. I'm actually surprised that we haven't heard more rumblings from that area, especially now. 
a huge concern is my, I, so my, my thoughts after, you know, one of Steven, who you're going to talk to tomorrow, Steven's, um, big things is what did, what did someone tweet if they're pro Palestine? What did they tweet the day after October 7th to see like, you know, as someone saying I'm pro Palestine, I just want, you know, peace for the Palestinians. And then I'll go look at their Twitter and see if they're a crazy person that said yeah. this was deserved. The Israelis deserved it or something like that. Um, it's, uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's hard to imagine them going to war with each other, but it's also uh, we see the uh, I don't know the destabilization. So my thoughts after uh, on ten seven were back to nine eleven, and I think back to the way re we reacted. And there were ways that the two big things I always think of were the uh, the Patriot Act, mm -hmm. and I think back to uh, the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Those were two things we were primed for. And while it didn't happen as quickly as like the bloodshed in Gaza has happened. Um, that's what my mind immediately goes to, which is an overreaction, a nation willing to concede to it, an <clears throat> international community primed to be open to the actions of a nation under fire. I don't know if October 7th, so it was, I guess, when did the actual invasion occur? I want to say it was the 29th. I might be wrong about that. The actual entry. Oh, the actual entry? Because they no. were bombing for a while. The long. bombing was heavy. <clears throat> um, so my biggest issue is that they didn't have a plan for humanitarian aid their plan was yeah but said ryan Shirley, you worry too much you know, Dude, like, to be clear it. like the first wanna... plan was nothing <clears throat> fuck you they're not getting shit and we're cutting it all off yeah. and it took the international community i think one of the hardest things i have to deal with when looking at that is people want to say well they said that but they ended up not doing it it's like they did that because the international community, the United Nations stepped in and said, you can't fucking do that. And then it's like, okay, do we just forget that they said they were going to do that? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of things, a couple of interesting things from this, from this conflict that I've noticed. You know, one is that it, it I thought we were going to see a hell of a lot more anti-tank missiles than we have, and we have not. From the uh, from the Palestinians. So okay. I thought we were going to see coronets. And nope, nothing. I haven't seen a single coronet. I mean, they're all in Lebanon. It might have been just too difficult to smuggle coronets, which a coronet is an anti-tank uh, missile similar to our tow, except it's it's not really laser guided. The uh, a, a laser grid is projected from the launcher, and there's a flare that kind of reads where it is inside the grid. And that's not important. But what's the origin it. of that? The, Coronet? Yeah. It's a Russian okay. Russian system that the Iranians copied and now give to uh, Syria and Lebanon. Hezbollah and Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the trophy system, the Israeli trophy mm -hmm. system. I don't think, and I, I, I've seen these dudes, and as an anti-tank guy, I go, like, well, that took some stones. To roll up and just fire an RPG-7 at a tank and kind of hoping you know that it won't get through the trophy system i don't we think we have the trophies on ours don't we we have them on like a hundred of our tanks i think they're all in europe so i mean the m1 the rm1 tank is getting close to the point where it is it is so overweight right now that uh it it, it we can't we literally can't put another piece of equipment on this <laughs> thing like it's it looks like you know it started out kind of streamlined and now there's you know all these Growth, it's it's like thick. <laughs> it's a thick boy. Now. <laughs> it is a thick I think it boy. started at it's at sixty tons. Now it's at seventy two, seventy three tons, something like that. So, but the the trophy system is working. I don't think I think I think the Palestinians have destroyed. I shouldn't say the Palestinians. Palestinians are great. Hamas are the jerks. And there's also nine other organizations: Islamic Jihad, <clears throat> in 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 that area as well. And actually, one of my big fears is that. Um, that there's going to be f internal fighting because as hostages are rescued, which only two have been rescued, but <clears throat> as Israel takes more land, there could be other Islamic units, or I should say anti-Israel units, militia, that try to fight Hamas to grab hostages so they have a bargaining chip, you know? Well, they're, that's, that's terrifying, well, especially if you're a hostage. Conflict between <clears throat> them isn't like, um, like in I think it was either 2008 or 2011. Um, I think it was before Operation Cast Lead. Um, there were rocket attacks happening, but they weren't done by Hamas. Hamas was fighting the other 
extremist groups saying, hey, fucking knock it off for maintaining this peace. <laughs> like, don't do this shit. Um, I, I think that's been a, a huge point of conflict with me and, and other people in the in the space is um, is that there were times where Hamas is like, we're maintaining the peace. Don't do this. Like Operation Cast Lead, Israel planned it for a year and then they broke the ceasefire. And, and it's like uh, the example I want to use is too inflammatory, but uh, but the um, but it is people believe it's like well hamas started the war it's like no israel bombed like egypt they had thousands of tunnels on their side of the of the uh of the border yeah uh egypt bombed the tunnels on their side israel decided to bomb like 32 and 16 of which were on that side and ended up killing like six or or eight people and um and they broke the ceasefire and even uh, like for a certain amount of time like there was an attempt to like still maintain and then rockets became too many and then the war started, but it was like it was a preempted war. Like Israel knew what was going to happen. There was something I think back in the '60s where Israel had done the same thing with Egypt, knowing that like certain little things would happen and certain little uh, actions would well, eventually provoke it. They they launched an attack because they saw Israel was or Egypt was building up on the border, and they're like they they destroyed the Egyptian air force in a day, in hours. It was absolutely amazing. <clears throat> oh, I mean, really, don't get me wrong. From a military perspective, the fucking shit in the 60s was amazing. incredible. Oh, well, so talking about equipment, we've, we've proven the trophy system works. I mm-hmm. think the the Hamas has destroyed one namer, and they've gotten some mobility kills. On I'm sorry, Merkava's. I'm not familiar with the namer system. Uh, the namer, it, it's uh, they took a Merkava, and they just took the turret off, and now it's an APC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the namer. I might be pronouncing that wrong. Like, people... You know, I I, uh, I guess I speak Hebrew with a, with a, an, uh, an Egyptian accent. I, I don't really speak Hebrew. I know a couple of words. Uh, when I was uh, living in New Jersey, I lived in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Where is that in relation to, I guess, New York? Uh, I, I know it's New York. like right outside of Philadelphia. Okay. So it's okay, like cool. right on the other side of Philly. And I grew up in Lindenwald, which is you know right outside of, you know, it's, it's the last stop on the Patco line, which is this train line, right? And, um, you know... Uh, I, I, at the time, like when I got out, when I retired from the military, I owned 13 guns. And I was like, you know, if you buy a gun every two years, eventually you end up with 13 guns, right? And so I was, I was really into shooting back then. And, um, I, uh, I remember like I would go to the range and like the only, Cherry Hill is a very heavily Jewish population. The only other Jews there that owned guns were former Israelis. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, like, I, I would be invited to their card games and stuff like that. And I learned a couple of words of Hebrew, you know. Um, and actually, like, when I moved to Washington, D.C., I got rid of, like, all, all my guns. Like, I, I got rid of everything but two pistols and a twenty two rifle. Because I'm like, what the hell do I? You know, I, I, I don't need an AR-15. I don't need a, a gun that shoots $1 bills. I have no problem with, with rifles like that. But... I can have just as much fun with a twenty-two. <laughs> you know, I'm not shooting one dollar bills, right? And I'm not I'm not reloading because I like to smoke and I like to drink. And that sounds like something you shouldn't do if you're reloading brass, right? I I, th- I think if you're an experienced professional, it's okay to have a, a beer and shoot a gun <laughs> in the right environment. Well, well I'm thinking of reloading because like five five six. I, w- I was at Dick's. Uh, there was a there was a woman I was dating who. Um, who uh, she had just bought a gun, and she asked me to go with her. You know, like, I guess. And what's funny is that the clerks were like talking to me. I'm like, no, talk to her. I'm, you know, and she wanted me there, so they didn't push mm-hmm. anything on her that she didn't want. But I bought. Uh, I was doing some testing at the. T- I made a video with a guy named Curtis Hallstrom. He lives in Ohio. He runs the VSO Gun Channel, and so we were going to do a video to see if you could actually use a semi-auto civilian style AR-15. In Ukraine, it does it have the same accuracy as a military M4? And what we discovered is that the one and eight twist actually kind of does. I'm like, oh, wow, all right, that was kind of that was not the results I was expecting. One and nine was all over the place with with military, but I had to buy military ammo there. Mm. And I'm like, 250 rounds. I think I paid like <clears throat> I want to say it was like 200 bucks. I'm like, what the hell? This is <laughs> like, insane. What the hell? What, what year was this? Because I know there was like an ammo I, spike like a few years back. I want to say it was two years ago. Uh, that was like, my God, that's like 
eighty cents a round, something like that. Like I'll stick with twenty two. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, oh, F thirty five. So Israel has been flying the F thirty five. Israel got the first space kill ever on a Houthi ballistic missile. No shit. They used an F thirty five to shoot down an incoming ballistic missile that was headed toward Israel. So. So we one of the things that we've proven is that the F thirty five can be rode hard and put away wet, and if you have good maintainers on it, and Israel's always been good at turning around their weapon systems. Like that's Oh yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> they're um they're really big into I think I learned this in the six day war. A a plane that's on the ground being maintained is not an effective asset, right? So they, I think it's like they can turn around a plane in a half hour. Like the plane lands, get the pilot out, put the new pilot in, put fuel in it, put ammo on it, get it back in the air. I want to say it's 30 minutes. Now, I'm sure eventually you need to do the jope test and get the oil changed and all that You've stuff. You've reached some maintenance mark. Where <clears> you yeah, have you to have to hit that maintenance. Yeah, yeah. and you, what you don't want is chips in the engine, right? Yep. Or whatever. But, um, yeah, they, we've, they've proven that the F-35 works. Um, they've proven the trophy system works. Um, if they can only get the humanitarian part right, like, you know, I, I, what, again, like, while we're dreaming, I want a pony. What kind of they should have done was as they're going in, all right, let's set up a camp for people, invite some people back in. We search them as they come in. We get biometrics as they come in, live in this camp here. We're going to, we're going to feed you. We're going to set up a school. I would imagine that anybody who was, a, is a diabetic is dead they're yeah. dead anybody who was getting kidney dialysis is dead so how many people in gaza have cancer and they've mis been missing their cancer treatments for five months i don't know i'm not a doctor i don't know what happens if you miss your cancer treatments for five months but i would imagine it isn't good i mean when right. when it when people will go into the office in general and and be told um and they'll be told like you need to start now and it's like no mm. you can't start next week you have to start now i mean it's at that point like i assume that cancer can be so aggressive that days can it matter probably depends at on the, the point cancer, yeah right? absolutely yeah. so yeah no it's hard to imagine people i not say as i guess smoking <laughs> <laughs> cheers to that <laughs> like, <laughs> i love this stuff like i I mean, I, I, I've, I've, um, I actually built a, uh, I, I just got a house recently. Mm -hmm. My, um, so I, I live in an, uh, I lived in an apartment in Silver Spring, Maryland <clears throat> that I got when I first moved down here thinking, oh, I'll be in here for a year and then eventually I'll get a house. And I just, I just never did. You know, I got comfortable where I was. So I lived in this two bedroom apartment because I had this fantasy of like, oh, my, my family's going to come down and they're going to see me because I live in D.C. Well, let's go to the monuments. Let's go to the Air and Space Museum. So I need that second bedroom. No, they never came down. <laughs> they never came down. So I'm paying, I was paying $2,500 a month for a two-bedroom apartment in Washington, D.C. Or right in Maryland, Silver Spring, which is two blocks away. Actually, I moved to Silver Spring because I do own a pistol. And I don't. I didn't want to jump through the mother may I hoops and have a three round magazine. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in Washington, DC. <laughs> like my magazines have a dollar value. Thank you very much. I'm not going to pin them just because, you know, you guys think is two extra rounds and my SIG is more dangerous. But, uh, so I li was living in, in solar spring and they're going to raise my rent to 3,200 a month. Like that's a little, it's, it's a little bit of a jump. It's a right? fucking pretty big jump. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking, like, why am I still here? Because I can't smoke on the balcony anymore. They banned smoking even on the balcony, and they you couldn't do it in the courtyard either, which is where they had, like, little lawn chairs set up, the little outside set up. I was like, why am I still here? So I figured, you know what, I'm just going to go buy a house. So I found a fixer-upper, and luckily I did do a little bit of carpentry. Right, and I, I bought the house, VA loan, no money down, which is like, you know, thank God, like, because I, I, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of expenses. Mm -hmm. I, I am not a wealthy man. You know, YouTube hasn't made me rich beyond my wildest dreams. I'm, I'm making do. You know, I, I can pay my, I can pay my mortgage, I can buy food. You know, I can uh, afford. Uh, you know, to put a little bit of money away, and I can afford to put some into my retirement, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm almost, I'm almost fifty. 
you know, like <clears throat> retirement. I got more years in back of me than I do in front of me, right? So I, I don't want to work forever. Um, <clears throat> and YouTube pays okay. It doesn't pay great. I get a lot of videos demonetized. Really? Oh, like crazy. Like crazy. I, uh, I made a video. Yeah, and when you get demonetized, I don't know if you're that familiar with it, but when you get demonetized, you get put in YouTube jail. <laughs> so I've been, in, I've been doing all day in YouTube jail. I've seen like, that. I, I, <clears throat> so I just got my monetization. Mm -hmm. I didn't know you had to do a verification through AdSense. Mm -hmm. So I just got that finished. Um, and when I went to the panel today, it was like something about Ukraine. Anyone that exploits, um, downplays or something like that, uh, those are demonetized. So I assume if you're talking about Ukraine, is that the kind of thing you're dealing with? Or It's usually violence. Yeah. It's violence. Because, like, all right, I'm going to analyze this video of this armored personnel carrier that got hit. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how can I do that without showing the carrier get hit? Mm -hmm. So I did a video just yesterday about a um, – there was uh, a – the it wasn't the – I actually, I said the Freedom for Russia Legion. I was actually kind of incorrect. It was SAR. Or SA, it was it was another group of ethnic Russians who are fighting for Ukraine against Russia. So whenever Ukraine wants to do an incursion into Russia, they always use ethnic Russians. Either the Freedom for Russia Legion or one of the other two battalions that they have that will mm -hmm. they'll hit, they'll go into um, to Belograd Oblast. And uh, so these guys, they went into this one town. And uh, one of them had an AT-4, which is a light anti-tank weapon from Vietnam. Probably donated by Canada, Finland, or Denmark. You're talking about that green tube, right? Yeah, the uh, green yeah. tube from yep. falling down. Yep. Right? That green tube. So these guys, one of them tried to hit a T-80, try to kill a T-80 with this thing. And it just, I don't know if it armed in time, but this T-80 was, it was moving like all hell was chasing them. So I guess they were in a fight by the border, and they were like, we're not playing anymore, and they just left. And they ran right into this other unit, and this other unit tried to hit them with the law. Now, my other thought was they probably knew the law wasn't going to penetrate, but they were like, I'm not carrying this damn thing back. <laughs> you know, I'm getting rid of it. This is heavy. So <clears throat> they fired at the T-80. It didn't penetrate. The T-80 kept moving. So I analyzed that video. Well, YouTube demonetized it. So I had to cut it again. And cut it again. I, it, they demonetized it twice. Now, when they demonetize something, two things happen. The first is you only get money from uh, YouTube Pr Prime or Premiere, you know, the, mm -hmm. their, their service where you pay for YouTube every month. So you only get money from those people. And then no, fewer people see it. Because if they can't run ads against it, then why should they run it? So fewer people see a demonetized video. I got demonetized uh, doing a video about Starfield, the video game Starfield. To tell you, so I had a, a video. So mm -hmm. I cook for Steven, like mm -hmm. as a side gig. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I was doing these cooking streams that I do where like I have the GoPro mm -hmm. on my, he my head yeah. and it's doing like a live, like mm -hmm. first person view stream. And so people get to see me chopping the onions, I'm talking to them and all that stuff. So I'm cooking for them and the next day I get a, a strike against my channel and I'm like, what, what, the, what the heck is that? And, uh, and it said COVID misinformation. And I'm like, I did not say a thing about COVID misinformation and I'm fighting with them. I'm like, yeah. please do a review, <clears throat> whatever. And, um, so we go, we go back, we go back and I, li I listen to the video and I hear Steven in the background. Mm. I don't even want to say it because we're on YouTube right now. But I, I hear him saying, what about all the deaths? What about all of this? But he was mocking people that are like anti-vaccine. But he wasn't saying the actual message like, I believe this. He was just mocking them. And I fucking, because he was barely audible in the background. I got hit. You know, I, that was I, all Russia, right? Oh, oh yeah. Russia absolutely. killed a million Americans. Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Russia killed a million Americans. If they had done that with a nuclear weapon, we'd be at war with them right now. Yeah. And that was um, that was kind of their effort to... I talk about misinformation a lot. And I, I am not an expert in misinformation. I just encountered it so much while doing my videos that I just kind of became an expert in misinformation. If you want, if you want a really good misinformation expert, Carolyn or Bueno. Well, sorry, let me take that down. Carolyn or Bueno. 
You can find her on LinkedIn. I have her email, so. Do you know how to spell that last name? Uh, O-R-E, I think. O-R-R, maybe? B-U-E-N-O. She, she, her substack is weaponized.substack.com. I'm going to, I'll reach out about like that. Like, one yeah. of her things is she did uh, an excellent uh, analysis of misinformation in Hawaii. In Hawaii? After the wildfires in Hawaii. Okay. And how essentially Russia was planting false information and, you know, go to this uh, particular center, uh, the space lasers that caused wildfires. None of that happened. The, the biggest bit of misinformation, and when I, I saw Tulsi Gabbard go on Joe Rogan and pop, 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 $600. So there was this, this piece of misinformation that went out about um, how uh, the United States government only gave $600 to people, survivors of the Hawaii wild, wildfires. And that's true, but it's not true. So apparently when you go to the government and say, I'm homeless now because of a wildfire, <clears throat> the government hands you a gift, uh, like a debit card for $600. And that's enough to get yourself a hotel, maybe buy some clothes, and then you come back the next day and you apply for your actual aid. But everyone got fixated on this. We want, we're giving Ukraine $6.2 million. We're only giving 600 uh. to... Yeah, <clears throat> so everyone got fixated on that. But again, nobody, nobody sat, nobody sat down in front of America and said, "Look, this is what's going on. This is the actual truth." One of the things I've, I've advocated for is uh, I've said that we need offensive PAOs. Now, for those of you watching, a PAO is a public affairs officer. And right now, our public affairs officers, they're used to dealing with traditional media. They're, they're really not used to dealing with YouTubers like me. Like, uh, I am slowly winning over Army and Navy and Air Force PAOs because they understand, like, hey, I want to tell your story. I'm not going to talk about how American snipers kill babies. You know, I'm going to talk about, like, all right, <clears throat> this is how the sniper selects his shot. This mm -hmm. is what they actually do. This is the equipment they use. I'm going to talk about the cool stuff, right? Yeah. So... And actually, I was just at Project Convergence Capstone 4, which was an exercise in uh, Camp Pendleton, which uh, we're, we're going to be able to defeat China's magazine. You know, China has more missiles than we'll, we'll ever have. But we have this new tactic of any sensor, any decider, any shooter. So theoretically, you could have a, uh, a Special Forces guy from New Zealand see a, a Chinese uh, missile launcher. And he can call an American AWACS. And the American AWACS, that's where the decider is. Now, AWACS is an Airborne Early Warning Command Center. So it's basically a flying, it's a 707 that flies. With a giant fucking saucer with on it. a giant it. saucer on yep. it with a radar, and it command and controls the battlefield. And that AWACS can contact, let's say, the, the closest missile launcher or the one that's more survivable. Let's say it's a Filipino high Mars system. Mm hmm and that Filipino high Mars system can fire at that Chinese missile system. So any sensor, any decider, any shooter. And that's how we, we defeat China's magazine capacity. Okay. Through that. Oh, man. Uh, I, have so <laughs> many, I have so many things. Like, I, I, yeah, want, I, I want to go back to like some things with the Israel-Palestine with Hamas and all that stuff, but, but you've sent me down the path. So the, you want to um, talk about China? So... <clears throat> When it comes to ICBMs, or mm -hmm. when it comes to our ability, like, you know, we're, we're not supposed to, you correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not supposed to have any sort of system that can shoot down nukes. Is that the that case? That was, so we had uh, the ABM treaty. I think that ended in 2001 because Russia backed out of it. And our system, we have a system in Alaska and in California. I think it's 50 missiles. It's mainly kind of looking at North Korea. Mm -hmm. I think it's 50 missiles in each site. I'm doing this. This is the bad part about doing podcasts because you're trying to like reach back into your brain. <clears throat> and it's funny because I've, I've listened to other podcasts like Joe Rogan, you know, and I go, no, you're wrong. It's actually this. Well, you're put on the spot and you have to yeah. <laughs> give this information up on the spot. But for right? me, you get no judgment. I understand. <clears throat> right. So we have two... Uh, systems and the uh, I want to say it's the SM6 on the Arleigh Burke class destroyers. 
Oh, the SM6, they can shoot down ICBMs. We don't have a lot of those. And again, I think they're kind of located in the Pacific and North Korea. Um, so that, I believe, ended in the, two, I want to say 2000, 2001, because the Russia pulled out of the ABM Treaty. So now, yes, we, we can shoot down ICBMs, but we can't shoot down all of them. We so, might be able to shoot down two flying from North Korea. So what's the, I guess, yeah, what is the, um, like, our, our, I guess, threat? Obviously, some of these things might be classified, um, yeah. but it, it's like, is it a concern for us that in the event that you know Russia goes crazy, China goes crazy tomorrow, someone with the nuclear capability to actually send things to our, our country? Um, is there any, I, I guess, like, hope feels like a weird word, but as if, like, we're going to be suddenly surprised, but like, <laughs> no, actually, we're okay. We can, we can handle that. So it depends on the threat. <clears throat> so I've, I've said this before, because actually a, a kid from, um, a kid from a uh, high school in, um, in uh, Seattle actually asked me this question a couple of days ago about nuclear war. When people think about nuclear war, they think of total commitment. Mm -hmm. Think of war games. All of the missiles firing all at once. Like the movies. Like the movies. And I actually think that uh, that isn't a very realistic scenario because I think any adversary knows that we're, we're just going to be able to pummel them. <clears throat> now, I think the one thing going for us is I, I believe we have 5,000 warheads. Some are gravity bombs, like bombs that are dropped from planes. Some are missiles. Some are uh, trident. Or some are on submarines. Um, and those weapon systems, we, we maintain at the ready 1,500 nuclear weapons. I believe that's correct, 1,500. And the rest are in storage and can be made ready. Now, when I look at Russia, Russia has roughly the same amount. And I think that came from the START Treaty, <clears throat> which is in the 80s, and the START and START II. Um, but I don't... So one of the big issues is that you look at the state of the Russian army and how some of their soldiers don't even have socks. They wear Port Yankee, which are these, these almost like a handkerchief that you wrap around your foot in a certain way. And it's actually the Russian soldiers, one of the first things they, they learn is how to tie Port Yankee. And actually, that's a, that's a feature, not a bug, because, you know, uh, Port Yankee, it's very easy to manufacture. You only have to manufacture one size. And they, they dry really fast. Just hang them around your neck and they'll dry. You know, it, it's a very Russian solution to not having the ability to make socks in multiple sizes, I mean, right? Are they walking around with, uh, are they walking around with, uh, I don't know, the, uh, with blisters and stuff? Or is it actually like working for them? If you don't tie them correctly, you will. And actually some Ukrainians wear Port Yankee as well. Like okay. the guys who are in the Soviet era, you know, it's just what they, it's actually kind of like a, a, uh, Knowing how to tie Port Yankee is, is like a, it's almost like us shining our boots. Okay. Right? Got it. Back when we used to have to shine boots. So. I fortunately missed that era. <laughs> yeah, I got you the were, combat right, boots. So you were the, <laughs> you were the, all right, that's fine. So I think one of the, the questions is tritium. So tritium uh, is a radioactive isotope. And uh, tritium is necessary for a thermonuclear explosion to kind of boost the reaction of a thermonuclear explosion. And you have to replace the tritium. Uh, tritium has a half-life of about 15 years. So okay. if you have a watch, like my watch is tritium. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> gun sites, some gun sites have tritium, so they glow yep. in the dark. And you have to replace them every 15 years or so because after 15 years, half of the tritium is gone. So that's a half-life of about 15 years. So the question is, do Russian nuclear weapons have enough tritium? Or have they been maintaining those weapons? Because you look at the current state of the Russian army, which is something you might actually use, but then you look at their strategic rocket forces. Well, we're never going to use this ICBM. Do we really need to maintain it? Right? Just having it in the silo is enough deterrence. Now, I would I would imagine all of the uh, all of the nuclear weapons on their uh, I think it's the Bori class submarine which is their their uh, boomer it's their ballistic missile submarine uh i bet those have tritium that's plenty but what i what i i have trouble believing that russia actually has maintained their stock of nuclear weapons so i don't think there's much of 
of a threat as we would like to think. Now, that being said, China, I think they have between 200 and 250 nuclear weapons. I know they're trying to get more. Uh, and we can beat them three for one, right? What I envision would be a strike on something like uh, a single missile fired from a submarine um, at, a, at a place like Bentonville, Arkansas. What's in Bentonville, Arkansas, Ryan? I, I, <coughs> it's Walmart. <laughs> Walmart. Bentonville, Arkansas, or Jane, Missouri. Jane, Missouri is where Walmart's data center is. So... 41% of Americans get their food from Walmart. You take out the data center, you take out Walmart, the headquarters of Walmart. America is going to have to run around trying to figure out how to get food to 41% of the country. So the IT guy in me is was like, well, they have to have like DR recovery zones where they're going to be, you know, located in secret, never disclosed publicly kind of places where should that happen? Did Walmart prepare for a nuclear strike? <clears throat> no. I just assumed they were prepared for a <laughs> you, you fire. Would, you would think, right? A data yeah, center fire, a fire, yeah. right? So I know they have a backup data center. I actually can't remember where that is. But, you know, you could you could take out, you could hurt America just by taking out Bentonville, Arkansas, where Walmart's headquarters is. Now, when you think about it, a cyber attack would be a much more effective weapon. Mm, absolutely. Right? Because then there's no residue of that nuclear yeah, there's there's no uh, and if if a country like China decides to attack the U.S., you do a cyber attack, and well, we're not going to respond with, with a nuclear attack. No, you brought that attack. up earlier with Probably the uh, you know with the bots on Russia and stuff like you know people COVID misinformation, the amount of people that died from that. We don't have to deal with that. Like uh, we as in a nation aren't going to war over you know that kind of disinformation campaign. No, although I I'm actually I. I I've said this at, at conventions that we need to start kinetically targeting misinformation practitioners. So if you're a foreigner and you're a bot or a sophist, and when I say bot, uh, a bot doesn't necessarily mean automated. A bot could be a person who's typing from a script. Right, they've got multiple <clears throat> terminals in there. Oh, yeah. I've, I've actually, I discovered five bots on Twitter and they all work with each other. I'm actually gonna come out with a video about this fairly soon. Um, but it, it's like they're not even trying. Like they, they, it's so obvious once you actually look at all their tweets. I took down their whole tweet history and I ran analytics on it. I, I developed what's called a pattern of life. Mm -hmm. So I know when these people are on. And that's, that's the first step to putting a hellfire through someone's window, right? Like, all right, let's see, let's see what their pattern of life is. So we know when they're on, when they're off, when they're whatever, right? Um, so I've actually I've advocated at, at various conventions, cybersecurity conventions, and with the military that we need to start actively targeting people who are spreading misinformation, and that means kinetically. And if that means putting a hellfire through somebody's window, well, this is man stuff. You want to do man stuff? All right, let's do man stuff. <laughs> so okay, so you have familiarity with targeting practices. And I wrote the software that the, the, the targeting cells and the weapon ears use. I never, I never did any of the actual targeting, but yeah. So one of the issues I have when it comes to uh, uh, Israel-Palestine mm -hmm. is the significant amount of infrastructure that's been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a historical precedent that through multiple operations, they take down critical infrastructure, even if it's not being used as a base of operations. So I'm talking about like then cast lead, I think it was, maybe protective edge. They took down the only wheat processing plant that was in Gaza at the time, right? Things that end up inevitably making them more reliant on Israel. Mm -hmm. You know, there were only at the at ten seven. I don't ten six. I don't, I don't know at post ten seven, but ten six. There were only three desalination plants, and mm -hmm. they were very you know low capacity, um, not able to do a significant amount of you know providing mm -hmm. as far as water goes. Um, so there has been a significant amount of infrastructure. I think the UN report a few months ago said that 45% of civilian living areas were damaged or destroyed. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact, I think it was like, it's up to like 18% completely destroyed and, mm -hmm. and, uh, 46% damaged. And the damage rating, my understanding is also coming from 
satellite information. So yeah. it's not just like a broken window, right? At that point, it's it's clearly visible. This has been you know uh, hit. Um, so for targeting operations, you have a few different types of, uh, types of targets. You have predetermined targets, right? These are known entities where they're housing, you know, uh, weapons caches mm -hmm. or where, you know, military operations are taking place. You target those, right? But then you have more, um, you know, kinetic operations where it's, hey, we know this is a base of operations. But one of the Hamas uh, techniques is to do fire and fuck off, uh, where they're going to go one place, they're going to shoot a yeah. rocket, and they're going to go. But we're dealing with an entire city where they're operating out of because they, they can't create a military base and go operate out of that because, well, that puts their very yeah. small military capacity in the open. Um, and that's something I, I have an issue with is that, you know, we know and they know that these people are firing from an apartment complex and then going away. They're not staying there. So that complex feels to me doesn't maintain that military target status because at that point any building that could be fired from might as well be a military target and mowed down but at that point you get to the entire city anything that could you know because gaza city is so close to the mm -hmm. israeli border <clears throat> so it's it's like uh you know how do we how do we i guess uh, rectify that or or how do we how do we square that you know that so much is being destroyed in that in that area when civilian infrastructure has protected status well it's tough because the second someone uses someone's house i, I did a video about this <clears throat> the second someone uses someone's house as a firing position now it becomes a lawful target now whether they're there or not it depends on how fast you can actually get the hellfire through the window right like that's that's kind of the question the uh, I, I recorded a video <clears throat> where i talked about uh this one, uh, it was actually really clever what they did, but it actually kind of bothered me too because Hamas knocked um, knocked holes through this dude's wall. It's some dude's house. Like, why, why are you knocking holes through their freaking wall, right? Right. <clears throat> and they set up these rockets, and they fired them at some sort of Israeli positions, and then Israel blew it up. But, like, it's kind of like what choice do you have, right? <clears throat> I know if... if and this is one thing that I, I've realized. It's that Israel's casualty rate is extremely low. Extremely low. Um, I think I, I envisioned they would lose between six and nine soldiers per day, three and nine soldiers per day. And it, it's, kept, it's been kept at roughly that number. Um, and one of the things is that I, I believe Israel looks at a house and they go, well, we can send a bunch of dudes into that house and clear it, or we can just level it with a JDAM. Now, if some civilian gets killed during that process, they don't get to vote in Israeli elections, but a grieving mother of an IDF soldier does. So if you're that commander and you have a choice, I'm like, well, you know, I could either send... I could send a, a rocket, I could, I'm sorry, I could send a bomb, or I could send an artillery shell, or I could send a platoon, and maybe two of those guys get killed. What are you going to choose? I know what we would choose. <laughs> I know we're sending the troops, right? Yeah, no, the, <clears throat> I think Usually. that's been the, the issue. Is like I, I've been accused of like having guilt for you know my involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan. But really, at the end of the day, like we just took extreme precautions um, in, in, in Fallujah both times. Um, we had a four week and the six week mm -hmm. operation between battle one, battle two. Yeah. Um, we spent a significant amount of time saying, get out. We are going to do, we're going to rain, you know, hate and discontent across this entire battlefield. You need to get out and do so. And both times, uh, you know, we only lost over, you know, four weeks and six weeks. Both times it was 600 uh, civilian casualties. You know, look at the first four weeks of, <clears throat> of Gaza. Look at the first six weeks of Gaza. Immeasurable in comparison as far as the number of casualties. Um, a lot of people like to say, in the early days of the war, I haven't heard much about it since, where they, people say, well, they're doing knock bombs and all that. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, they so don't do that anymore. You, no, they don't do that anymore. But <clears throat> even then, 
it's like you're going to do this in a highly populated area. Like Gaza is one of the most densely po- mm -hmm. I It's more populated than Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're going to drop these bombs in that area. You're going to do a knock bomb and it's going to be like, cool, you have 15 to 30 minutes to get the fuck out of there. The danger close radius of a lot of the artillery they're dropping is 750 meters. So if you're going to do that, we're not talking about hellfires. We're talking about larger munitions that are going to do a significant amount of damage. And these people have to evacuate. What about the infirm? What about, you know, the disabled and all that? Like, and people are saying they're doing, they're, they're doing everything they can. I'm trying to not do the like mocking voice, but like people are saying like they're doing everything that they can. Are they really though? Because there's a history. If you go to the, the international um, committee for the red cross, if you go to their website and you look under like, you know, warnings mm -hmm. and all that, Israel has a history of knowing how to do proper warnings where time is taken and it's not 30 to 60 minutes to react. Like these apartment complexes, you've seen, you know, these towers and all that. Yeah. There have been a few fire alarms that have gone off since I've been here. It takes a decent amount of time for yeah. everyone to get the fuck out. Yeah. Like, so to watch people just kind of like, I don't want to say hide behind it, but to, to see that go on and to just say, you know, they're, they're doing enough. I don't know. It's uh, from watching the things having sat behind a predator feed and watch how the, how those bombs work to, to have sat behind the phone and talk to the warrior on the other yeah. end where they're, they're, you know, doing like, can we validate this target? Is it good? Is it, you know, are we firing into an area that's going to be of concern to us later? It's weird to watch us operate that way and then watch Israel operate the way they are um, with what seems to be less regard for the implications of each attack. Like, I... Well, dead Palestinians don't vote. Right? They, they don't. Well, <laughs> but mothers of IDF no, soldiers do. You're not right. wrong because in in 2000, and, <clears throat> I think it was 2014, Operation Protective Edge. Mm -hmm. That that was the point in the in the Israel Palestine conflict. Because yes, we've had all these operations, we mm -hmm. had all these spats, but the war has been ongoing, right? Like technically, Israel declared war, you know, 10-7, right? But it's been going on for a significant yeah. amount of time. That's when they had the tunnel system in, and that was the first time that Israel took significant casualties yeah. and I, I put quotes not to mock Israeli you know uh, life loss but it's that they lost 66 people during that operation but to them in comparison to the thousands that died otherwise that was untenable you're absolutely right like one of their biggest concerns was the fact that people inside Israel were like we lost 66 people and it's like are you aware of the tens of thousands that have been displaced in Gaza well hearing is tough I mean the uh, the you're familiar with the you're familiar with the kill chain, right? Yes. <clears throat> so it's what find, fix, uh, track, uh, find, fix, track. I, I I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it, essentially for the viewers, you know, who who aren't familiar with this, the whole idea about the kill chain is you identify the target, you decide, you dispatch, you identify, you dispatch, then you uh, actually engage. And then you determine, all right, you do your battle damage assessment yeah, on that target. Yeah, PDAs, yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, once when, when you're tracking people now and you decide, oh, Daddy El Baddy is in this group. All right, let's, let's, <laughs> that, that's Daddy El Baddy. All right, well, what's the next thing you do? Well, the next thing you do in the, it is you go, okay, what do we have in the airspace right now that can take out this target? All right, we got two F 15s over Baghdad. Let's say you're in Mosul. All right, well, it's going to take a half hour, 15 minutes. It's going to take 15 minutes to get the back of these F-15s. Oh, these F-15s, they only have 2,000 pounders, 2,000 pound bomb, 2,000 pound JDAMs, which are a guide munition, but very big. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we got a Predator down at uh, down in uh, Buka. All right, well, it's going to take two hours to get there. What else we got? All right, well, we got uh, a, a National Guard unit from Michigan that might be able to cordon off the road. So you're, you're doing all these calculations and you might say well if if we let daddy el baddy go then we might not get another chance at this so all right well what time is it well it's one o'clock when does school let out school lets out at three all right so are there vehicles on the road you know you're, you're going through all of these targeting decisions to, to determine all right is it okay to use a 2,000 pound bomb all right well if we use this 2,000 pounder which is going to create a pretty big freaking crater we use a 2,000 pounder. Um, 
is that going to cr it, it will probably kill civilians will it kill too many if it's over 10 we have to call centcom if it's over 30 we have to call the white house and see if they're so there there's yes we do all of this stuff i i would not be surprised if israel is going through that going through that process but that process might be a little more truncated because they're angry <laughs> no, know, like, no, that's and, like no and i get that yeah. but that's where like after on 10 7 i'm thinking 9 11 and i'm yeah. thinking please don't do what we did like don't massacre civilians because we're angry like we really did like at, at the end of the day we did kill civilians unnecessarily in two different invasions we um, tried not to we we, we tried it it's a frustrating thing if you read about uh, you know the multiple attempts to like kill Osama bin Laden mm -hmm. like how many of those times where at the farm or at the you know the the falcon hunt did we not take action because it was like we don't know we don't know if the royal family is at the falcon hunt we don't know how many of uh, Osama's wives and children are at this and it's like the first time because you know in the early 90s we were like fuck it we're done with Afghanistan we don't give a shit we're not really paying attention and then the later 90s, especially after the attacks in, Af in uh, Africa, it, we're aware. And it's like we need to take out Al Qaeda. We have the, the bin Laden unit at the CIA frothing at the mouth. You know, they're, they were considered cult leaders, right? Like it, it was wild and crazy for them. We yeah. must kill bin Laden. Um, but, you know, some will criticize Clinton for being, you know, very weak willed when it came to taking action. But when you look at the situations where we had multiple attempts to do so, it was a concern for civilians. Um, and, and I'm sure there are people who would look at it now and say, yeah, but look at, you know, how, you know the 5,000, 10,000 Americans that have died in the wars that came. Um, it's a difficult thing to look at, but there seem there feels to me to be that lack of humanity, uh, especially when we were, you know, killing two, we, uh, Israel's killing 2,000 people a week. And it's like, is that, is that, really thoughtful targeting like when i think about signals intelligence when i think about when you're you know you're tracking someone and and trying to find exactly where they are when you're thinking about the amount of damage being done to civilian infrastructure mm -hmm. um you know people will say well yeah but if you look at the number of bombs dropped and only one person per bomb was killed it's like all right do we think that they have 50 percent of the deaths are hamas if so they have to hamas which incredible Despite the, the civilian death, they have Tomas. I don't believe that to be accurate because in the majority of the major three operations that have happened in the last 20 years, it's been 60, 65, 70% have been civilian deaths. So I give people a 70, 30 split, which I still think is incredibly generous with the significant amount of weaponry that has been dropped on, on uh, Gaza. I have no love for Hamas. What I do have is a significant amount of empathy for you know, as we talked about a little bit earlier on, is the history of this region and what they've gone through. And my belief is this. We give Palestine a state and international recognition. We cannot ignore the fact that we learned lessons in like Afghanistan, which is bring the Taliban to the table. Mm -hmm. Our failure to do so led to a significant fuck up on our part because we ended up dealing with the Taliban in the long run. Um, all we fuck telling people there's a withdrawal time i will never get over that uh, yeah that probably wasn't uh, our best hour right there <laughs> like just wait till after this date oh uh, god but i mean by that point yeah, it got bagram probably wasn't the smartest thing either no no but you know that's i i had, i i was actually thinking like we you know people talk about forever wars but when you look at when you look at afghanistan like I love it takes 40 years it takes 40 years screw it right I and mean, you can rotate people through and people can they can hone their skills you know that was a huge issue is that we kept fucking rotating people it's like sorry mm -hmm. uh, like you're gonna come in you're gonna be a diplomatic position for this mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna spend a few years here yeah uh, for for military like you know i went to uh uh, in Iraq, mm -hmm. I went to um, Ramadi and Fallujah. Mm -hmm. Like that wasn't so much significant as far as uh, losing regional knowledge. Like yeah. it was very quick to get spun up and get into the mission. But when you go to Afghanistan, I'm, the the litany of fuck ups 
setting a, a centralized government when tribal government from from the different provinces is so significant to Afghanistan, fuck up number one. Mm. Fuck up number two. ANA, ANP, like those should have been, again, regional things that report into the centralized government. But at the end of the day, like tribal security should have been tribal security. Like tribes, is an, they're, they're an intrinsic part of Pashtun culture, of Afghan culture, yeah. whether you're talking about the Uzbeks, whether you're talking about the, the Pashtuns. We tried to take our system of government and then just cookie cutter it onto Afghanistan, and that doesn't work. We failed to involve the Taliban in any future discussions when there were still, you know, a significant power for them. We tried to with the opium, like the opium was a significant source of income and revenue for a lot of yeah. these people. And the different ways that we tried to go about like eradicating it and all that. I was there with fucking Delta Force. Uh, I was not Delta Force. I got to make, uh -huh. make that clear. Uh -huh. yeah. um, but I was there when they were trying to do eradication efforts in Western Afghanistan. You can't do that in a country you can't just say okay grow corn what problem does that solve for me when i'm getting this much money for opium and this much money for corn no one gives a shit mm -hmm. so you know i mean i don't know there were so many different things there was one person who was um uh, uh i think the governor and w one of his cousins was you know involved in the growing of mm -hmm. opium and mm -hmm. he'd say okay cool we'll tear it down a lot of these people we were paying to tear it down would would not tear it down they would harvest it and then burn the fucking field like there were so many fuck ups i had yeah that does sound like some of they would do i have they no very practical people they were i'd have no problem <clears throat> if we were in afghanistan for 40 years what i do have a problem with is the litany of bad steps and the incoherent attempts at nation building if we went in and committed to nation building i'm not as avidly against it it's have the clear mission and mm. do it in line with what the people need. But we fucked that up from the beginning. When it came to the Mujahideen and backing them, it was there to our end to fuck over Russia, period, end of story. And as soon as we were done doing that, as soon as the Russians came out, pulled out, we left them to their business. And then the fucking dude in charge, he gets 86 by the, the Taliban. We still have the Northern Alliance um that's fighting we're kind of sort of you know liaising with them and supporting them and we don't give a shit until 9 11. he gets murdered on 9 10 9 11 happens and then suddenly we care again but he's gone um and sorry very frustrating no, I... absolutely fucking insane and then from there it's we do 88 days where's that light right now <laughs> 88 days to kandahar we we fucking roll them right and there are some mistakes like there there was an, a, a moment where we possibly could have taken out mula omar right and if we had done that we would have capitalized on the divides within the taliban and then because they were they were already like do we work with the americans do we not mm -hmm. syria fucking us over the isi fucking us over in pakistan syria saying uh we don't really want to touch it because they're dealing with their own militant islamists in in their country yeah. that very conservative islamic sect what the law hobbyists um isi is playing both sides because they have what they're doing in kashmir they've always wanted to have they they see that fundamental islam as something they can control over their border they're angry at the u.s for the pressler amendment they're angry with the u.s for dipping out of afghanistan saying not our problem anymore and i accept as an american responsibility for that like we did fuck them in that regard I just went on a huge tangent. Uh, yeah. All I'm saying how is. About, <laughs> how about I use the bathroom? You come up with some more questions and we'll. Uh, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to hit the latrine. We'll be back soon. How you doing over there, Kyla? Thumbs up. Did you? No, oh, the we tried to go for sushi in between, and it's oh, is like, it? There's a flash flood happening. <laughs> oh man, we heard it for a little bit. It was up yeah, the car doors. yeah, it was crazy. So uh, we turned around, and now I'm eating yogurt. How's the whiskey? Whiskey's good. You want some? Uh, I'm okay for now. Thanks. Nick doesn't like whiskey. I'm gonna get water. That's a good idea. Uh -oh. You're too excited. What do I cut to? 
Should I talk to chat? You can chat. Talk. What's up, it's chat? Like empty camera, but it's um, the wide, I think. Yeah, the wide for sure. Drunk level rising. What up, Cam? I love being able to hear myself. It's actually so handy. How y'all doing in chat? 242 watching. No shit. Is that a piece of duct tape? No, it's a um, it's a cigar wrapper. Oh yeah. That's I'm gonna grab that actually. Here, can you take this? Take the doggy. There you go. Uh yeah, I was gonna order some and then I realized we shouldn't order anything. Raiders, ask him about his cigars. Oh, did Stephen raid? Uh, I'm gonna hit that oh. as well. Okay. But Kyla, if you want to put the camera on, he's uh. The camera has not come off, so. No, no. If you want to put it on him, and uh, if you want to do any shout outs or any any plugs, I do not care. And we've not <laughs> been raided. Raiders is a person. Oh my god. Yeah. Any plug? The camera's on right now. Yeah. yeah the camera's on you. It's so there I you. was. No pressure. Pinned down. <laughs> down to my last round. Beautiful woman on top up of me. Up to my hill, up to my knees, <laughs> and hand grenade pins, and my bayonet was bent. And I said to myself, self, you're in a world of hurt. And then someone shouted, Index. And I said, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> index is the uh, the, the uh, military term for end exercise. And I was like, oh, we're all done. So I have to... You know, one thing I'm really good at is talking. Yeah. Um, I was actually, I was, um, I, I went to Substack, which is. Uh, yeah, I was reading your Substack today. Oh, I can give you a free account if you want. You can sure. Know, all the Fuck stuff. yeah. Um, so, the one on the doctor I thought was super interesting. Yeah. The. Uh, <laughs> so. I'm not going to ask you about it because uh, I've already prepped for tomorrow with that. Okay. Yeah. So there, there was a doctor who um may or may not have been in gaza now there was a uh <laughs> Big he wrote, may. yeah well he uh a picture surfaced of him at a hospital that i did not find with facial recognition but i basically i tracked this doctor by using uh software uh that uses the ad uh generating features in your phone so when you when you go into a store mm -hmm. and you're shopping you uh your phone is picking up the wi-fi and a store knows how long you stopped in front of pasta sauce and so right? then when you're at the counter that's crazy it might it might you might get a coupon for rouse pasta sauce you know the next time you next time you go for the next time you go shopping so i use that data because i knew exactly where this particular doctor's three uh building where his three offices were so i just found the cell phone that was consistently in those three offices <laughs> and what I found was that this dude, his cell phone never went to uh, to um, to uh, Dulles Airport. It never went to Newark Airport, which is where you no fly out of. No way! He, he, this is the guy who was on the news, right? This is the guy. He, he wrote a whole article. I have no proof this guy was actually in Gaza. Supposedly, there's a picture of him uh, at uh, at a hospital there. Uh, that I found that later, but there's no real evidence. So that that was kind of interesting. This this dude wrote a, an article about it, the article kind of smelled like he was saying like us. Oh, so I was I was dealing I was working on children who had been shot in the head by Israeli snipers. That's well, fucking Israeli crazy. snipers use a round called a three three eight Lapua, and that is a, a very high powered sniper round. There wouldn't be enough head to put on a Trisket. Mm. So there there were some holes in the guy's story, and it's it's actually one of the reasons I say were you a human intelligence collector. No. Okay. So I've always said human is a bunch of BS. <laughs> so, like, I, so I'm going to ask you, a, I'm going to prove to you how human is, is a bunch of, 
Humnant is a bunch of BS. All right, you don't have to answer me when I ask you this question. All right, you don't have to answer truthfully. Do you watch pornography? Yes. Okay. What kind? All kinds. Okay. That this did not work the way I thought it was going to work. <laughs> so my, what you were supposed to say was no, and the next question I would ask is, well, can I look at your browser history? So that's yeah. kind of what I do. When I uh, when I when I say human end is a bunch of BS, it's because people can lie, mm -hmm. and collectors of human intelligence, um, they can be lied to. And now, good guys, they'll, they'll figure out when this guy is lying. They'll check sources and so on. I'm betting. But if I can take a look at your browser history, I got you dead to rights. Yep. Your browser might as well be a, a second brain. Like, I, I know all of your hopes and dreams, all of your aspirations. I know you want to go to Italy. I know and you here's like all, this kind of all pasta the thoughts, sauce. The browser is the truth. You, you, you will tell your browser things you won't even tell your wife or your best friend. Right, but you'll tell, you'll tell your browser. If you're telling your browser, you're telling me. Yeah. So. <clears throat> as long as you know to look at Firefox and not Internet Explorer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we... Uh, I actually, I, I, I am, I am paid by, uh, by a company called uh, PAA VPN, uh, and I actually use PAA VPN. I, I used, I did a story on TikTok a couple of days ago, and why TikTok is so dangerous, and how easy it would be to create, um, say, a protest using TikTok. TikTok is a weapon. It is a cyber weapon. A lot of people don't like it when I say that. And how is TikTok I just watch food videos, man. Yeah, well, don't take those away know, from me. So, I don't think you can ever actually ban TikTok in the sense of saying, like, you cannot have this app on your phone. It is, it is, a, uh, um, it is a freedom of speech issue, right? But we can say that no adversary government is allowed to own a social media uh, organization that has over a million members. We can do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And back in uh, back in the God, for the longest time, up until the eighties or nineties, we didn't allow foreign ownership of uh, TV stations and radio stations. I didn't know that. No, that was actually a plot in in the movie Working Girl from nineteen eighty eight with uh, Sigourney Weaver and Melanie Griffith and Harrison Ford. Which I'm I, again, I'm almost fifty, so I remember <laughs> stuff like this. But the uh yeah there, in this particular movie working girl the secretary comes up with an idea to save her client by buying a radio station and you know this client was about to get taken over a hostile takeover by the japanese because back then the japanese are the boogeyman right you know and so that if we buy a radio station the japanese can't buy your company because they can't own foreigners can't own a radio station in the u.s i didn't know that but well now they can I mean, the FCC does it on a case-by-case -case basis. That's how Rupert Murdoch, who's an Australian, can own stations mm -hmm. here in the U.S. But I'll be honest, mm -hmm. for all my anti-conservative leanings, I didn't know Rupert Murdoch wasn't an American. I, uh, yeah, he's from Australia. I'm actually not sure. Is he still alive? I, he is. is he, I, Ro I, he Roger has... Ailes. Roger Ailes. Oh, okay. Died. Yeah, that was it. Roger Ailes from Fox News. But, yeah. So... <clears throat> that's one of those things where it's like, well, who watches the news? Like, I, I have a neighbor. This woman, she's uh, she's elderly. She's in her 70s. And she'll come over sometimes, and she'll she'll just tell me about every single medication she's on. She'll talk at me for like an hour, <laughs> you know, and I'll nod. And I'll, and then she'll, well, I got to go back. And she'll go back to her, go back to her apartment. And, um. You know, she uh, she watches CNN all day, and she's probably one of the most misinformed people on this planet because I think that you can't actually watch CNN all day because you're doing other stuff. You're making lunch. My girlfriend has a theory that the reason that Fox News, people like Tucker Carlson formerly and mm -hmm. all that have such high ratings is because it's just old people keeping their TVs on all day. Yeah, I, I would say it's probably accurate. Um, you know, when I uh, when I first got hired at Newsmax, there is this this the director of talent. Her name was Valeria, amazing woman. Valeria, she gave me the best advice I, I ever got for working in in the news industry or the media industry. She said, "When you go on as a talking head, 
imagine you're speaking to a woman who has kids pulling on her pants, who's trying to make lunches for those kids and half watching the news while she's doing it. Because it'll be too in-depth? You have 20 seconds to get your point across. And so, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on the news or have done a hit, but typically they'll, they'll send you, you know, they'll, they'll, what Newsmax does is they text me. They say, Ryan, are you available at 5 o'clock for, to talk about, you know, are you available at 5 o'clock for, for, uh, to go on Carl Higby? It's like, what's the topic? Uh, and they'll just say, Gaza. And which is like, oh, crap, i got to read all this stuff. <laughs> you know, because you have to be ready because they'll ask you any question, right? They might like, pop out some question from someplace else. And actually, I had a hit the other day where uh, I went on. Uh, I was st- actually stuck in traffic. And I was like, I, I texted the producer. I was like, I'm not going to make this hit. And the guy's like, well, what, what can you do? I'm like, well, I can park on the side of the road and I can just give a remote from. Now, one of the things that, that I try to do before I go on TV is I try to come up with something catchy, like something that I can say in under 20 seconds. And the topic that day, because I do cybersecurity stuff as well, the topic that day was um, that uh, insurance companies are raised this one dude's rates 21% because they looked at his driving history from the uh, from OnStar. So OnStar is tracking your driving, how frequently you're braking, how frequently you're mm-hmm. accelerating hard. This guy braked short twice, and he accelerated hard twice. Now, I don't know if it was that guy, because who knows who, maybe you lent your car to someone, and his insurance went up 21%, his car insurance. And what I said when I was on was, your, your car, a car today is basically a smartphone with four wheels. Yep. They love that. <laughs> Which is, you know, I, and that's, that's what you want to get across. Yeah. And yes, when you opt in to some of these safe driving programs, you know, I think all state, you plug your little device into the, to the bottom where some, some companies have apps that will monitor your driving while you're driving. Um, you know, when you opt in, yeah, you might get 10% off, but that might come at a cost. And who decides what is safe driving, what isn't safe I, I uh, When I signed up with uh, Progressive, the same thing. Like there's that little thing you can jack into your car, you know, and all that. And it's like, I'm not going to – I'll pay the premium in the normal price to not have that kind of bullshit. Because I don't know. You don't know why I had to do that. Like did I have to accelerate because there was some asshole trying to, deer? you know, screw up, screw me up? Yeah. Was there a deer? Why did I have to suddenly break? Why didn't I have to suddenly speed up? I mean, there are plenty of times where, you know, I don't know, you're driving on the highway and someone's merging and they're merging way faster than they should be. And it's like, okay, cool. I have to speed up. And I'm going 15, 20 over like that mm-hmm. because I drive a jet of GLI. Like, yeah, yeah it's going to happen. So. Oh, I have a uh, Tesla. I, I can, I can uh, get that thing up there. I, I, again, Curtis, ridiculous speed. Curtis Hallstrom, <laughs> that guy that I, that I, I shot guns with uh, two years ago, you know, he had never driven a Tesla. And I said, just open it up. What do you drive? Which, which I have a like? Model 3. Yeah? I have a Model 3. And let me tell you, man, that thing, I I, I did. I, I have the full self-driving, which I can put on, but I've had that thing up over 100 in safe conditions. <laughs> I've had it up. And Curtis, like, we, we got in the car, and he's like, let's see what this thing can do. And it can, you put it, because there's modes you can select on mm-hmm. it. I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to select sport mode, you know. And you will, uh, you move pretty darn fast. I don't even have like the plaid model, you know, which I could get, you know, but uh, I, I don't need to drive that fast. I mean, the electric car, my God, like uh, it, it, it is a supercomputer on four wheels, you know, and that thing is the best darn car I've ever had. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Without a doubt. It, it's weird, like getting back into a gasoline powered car. Like now, when I when I got my rental from the airport, because after this, um, so actually, uh, Kyla, when you, the reservation you made for me, I actually had to change the reservation to fly out of Tampa because I have to go to Tampa for two days, and you know it's one of those well, what's in Tampa? Well, you know, we all know what's in Tampa, right? Charlie's Steakhouse and uh, Burns <laughs> Steakhouse, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, not, not, not quite. There's, there's other, City, yeah. There's yeah. other things in Tampa that, that you might have to go to if you do Intel, right? So I, um, I went to, uh, you know, I had to change my flight, and I got a rental car. So 
So instead of taking an Uber here, I got a rental because I have to drive to Tampa on Sunday mm-hmm. for a, a, a Monday meeting. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I got, I think I have a Chevy Malibu. I don't even remember what I got. Hopefully I will when I go down to, to the valet and get it, right? So uh, I, I get in this car and I'm like, what the hell do I do? Like, I have to drive now. You know, I actually have to think about where I'm going. And, you know, I get in my test, like, boom, boom, boom. You know, it just takes me where I have to go. You know, I can't, like, be on my laptop or something. But it is, I got to tell you, the Tesla is the best darn smoker's car ever because I can take my hands off the wheel for a little while, light a cigar. <laughs> if only I had an ashtray, you know, that's something you, you know. Well, I, nowadays, you, you don't. Elon, a little put f- an ashtray in my Tesla. I, well, I, I don't know if you want to be smoking like that. <laughs> <laughs> Every ashtray that I, I, I grew up with, right, in the back seat, right, because the smokers, my grandma yeah. and my mom, all up front. In the back seat, they're all like gum wrappers and stuff in the in the ashtray. It's a little garbage disposal. Well, best. Well, I say I say that the best car I ever had was a Tesla. The car I had uh, in the military for, for a while. I had a I had a Saturn, but I also had a uh, a ninety eight candy apple red extended cab Ford Ranger. Yeah, that is. If you can't think of a more bachelor NCO car than that. No, right you, it's you like can't. <laughs> you can't it's wait, like wait. well in my in my day in the military the bachelor nco car was like a uh, uh what, what is it a camaro or a mustang really oh well, yeah because in my time people were getting these huge enlistment oh, bonuses or camaro, re- yeah. re-enlistment bonuses so for my mos people were getting 50 to seventy five thousand, depending on their thing and so the big thing was to do it overseas tax-free they had dealerships and and overseas. the fucking predatory deal now i I got a pretty good deal. I didn't get fucked. But a lot of people get out there and they're getting these fucking high interest rates because they don't know how to shop for cars. When I was in A school, mm-hmm. uh, it was a rule that you couldn't go buy a car in town without like bringing the paperwork to your mm-hmm. command because they were trying to protect you. And then my friend Lyndon went and fucking bought a Jeep and he almost got an NJP. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I do like the Jeep Gladiator. I think that's kind of nice. I would like it in white. I, will, I gotta look this. We don't have the pull it up system like Joe Rogan okay. yet. But let me let me see what the Jeep Gladiator looks like. Oh, it's it's a, it's a Jeep pickup truck. Jeep Gladiator. Okay, that's pretty sick. It, it's it's so it was. I think I it starts at forty six thousand, and like, you know, I I don't make that much money off YouTube. <laughs> You know, like, well, so one time I went to I went to get a rental car for work, mm-hmm. and there was a Jeep Wrangler. You know, your your typical yeah. you know Jeep, like the Jurassic Park Jeep, right. right? I got into it, and it was the most uncomfortable ride I've ever had. It there was that's like, a Jeep. It it was. I'm a little bit bougie when it comes to cars. I want to be able to like plug my phone yeah. in. I want to be able to you know use Bluetooth. It had none of that. It was just a jeep and the seats were uncomfortable and the ride was like i could feel it and i'm like isn't this supposed to do off-road terrain like what yeah. the fuck so i i went and returned that thing i wow. i the wrangler i didn't like i've been in a few other jeeps that were very comfortable like the uh the avalanche or something yeah. like that <clears throat> I, that that's great but the the normal jeep yeah. that was terrible i dated a girl who grew up in hawaii and i guess in hawaii at least at the time in the 80s uh you would get wednesdays off because it was like teacher training or something like that, PD. So you'd get a half a day on a Wednesday. Not you stationed out there? No. no okay. We're in Hawaii. Right? So um, this, uh, she, she grew up in Hawaii. I dated her here. Okay, gotcha. And she would tell me like, yeah, like on Wednesdays, we'd all pile into my friend's Jeep and we'd go to the North Shore and we'd go surfing. I'm like, that's the movie. Like, <laughs> people don't really do that. Like, no, they actually do do that. I. I was just in California at Camp Pendleton for, for Project Conversion's Capstone 4. And, uh, you know, in the morning I'd go for a run on, on – well, it wasn't really a beach. You can't really run on the beach there because there's rocks and all this stuff. But So I, uh, there's, like, a road that goes by the ocean. And people were out surfing. Like, before they go to work, they go surfing. And I went to this one restaurant there. And uh, there was a guy – it was, like, this super high-end restaurant. And like I'm dressed like this, you know, and like the the there's other people dressed in suits. It's like that California mm-hmm. restaurant that overlooks the sea, right? And like everything's like 
you know, forty dollars for an entree, right? But it's all fresh, and they they're talking about like, well, we got the scallops from you know this. I'm like, all right, cool. Our I chef just, himself went out this morning and dove. Yeah, for them. <laughs> like I, I I remember like like I asked for a beer, and they're like, oh, do you like uh, an IPA? Do you like the? Yeah, I'm like, do you have like a Miller Lite? <laughs> you know, Cor- How about Coors? They have like Coors three works. under the like, counter. Like, uh, fine. Yeah. You're that person. Do I look like the kind ca- I mean, like, I just, I'm a Coors, you know, Coors Michelob Ultra Bud Light kind of guy, right? Well, so I was talking with the waiter and the waiter. I, I don't know how we started on this because um, I think, so, oh, you know what? Some of the restaurant recognized me and he asked me, like, are you? Because people ask me, like, okay, oh, can I get a selfie with you? I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, and I'll, I'll take a selfie. It happened today on the – it happened at the Hertz rental – when I rented my car, the guy at the Hertz booth said, are you Ryan Macbeth? And I said, yes. And he said, oh, my God, I just watched one of your YouTube videos. And said, ah, do you want a selfie? And we took a picture. Um, so I, I get recognized a lot. But someone recognized me at the restaurant, and the waiter's like, are you famous? And I thought, that's a really weird question in California because like isn't everyone famous like then should like Tom Cruise come to this restaurant and stuff right like I'm really I'm not Tom Cruise famous right and it, and uh, what's funny is when I first started this thing and got famous like all the people that are, are into me are like guys my age it's like there's no like th- only three percent of my viewership are women so like this is not translated <laughs> into like any you know, I was all like, oh, some woman's going to be like, oh, my God, it's Ryan McBeth. Here's my number. Like, yeah, that hasn't happened. <laughs> like, that's just – that's uh, – let me, let me tell you a story. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, I had a, a video called Marine Pizza Delivery, mm-hmm. and it was just me, like, improvising a song, like, mm-hmm. chasing the pizza girl. Like, she, my friend ordered a pizza. I wrote the song – or not wrote it. It was improvised mm-hmm. entirely. But, like, it blew up mm-hmm. as far as, like, early – you know, YouTube standards it didn't go viral. It didn't yeah. hit the million mark. I don't yeah. even know if it has yet, but um, that happened. And then uh, I started getting like women that would message me and stuff like flirting with me and whatnot over, over, you know, YouTube yeah. messages and all that stuff. And, um, and so my friends, like we went to, uh, we went to a restaurant and uh, my friend gives me a, a business card and he says, Hey, the, the waitress recognized you hmm. and, and whatnot. And uh, here you go. And I was I was flattered and excited because I was a young you know yeah. a young marine. It was like all right, cool. And so I called that chick like three times, and they watched me do it, and they watched me call this number, mm-hmm. and it never picked up. And I was like, all right, whatever. And finally, they they told me they're like, yeah, no, we we wrote that on the business card. <laughs> Sounds like something a marine would do. <laughs> yeah, just screw it. Yeah, that's that sounds like. Uh... <laughs> that is something you do for your buddies. Like, let's oh, take this I mean, guy down has, a peg. He's been my best friend for for twenty years. Yeah, no, we we um we met on the way. For, so for Marines, we go to you guys go to AIT. Yeah, yeah, and I guess you after, call it A school. Uh, yeah, so you guys go so to. A- sometimes you do U- USAT or one station unit training. So if, if you're infantry, armor, or artillery, usually it's one station. But if you're like signal, you'll go to Fort Jackson, and then you'll go. Yep. To your AIT. Yeah, so I was I was in uh I was in uh Fort Huachuca, Arizona mm-hmm. with a bunch of like yeah. AIT bar- I snuck into an AIT barracks once. There was this cute redhead chick and uh and she says come over but like it's fucking patrolled by drill sergeants. Mm-hmm. Like you guys have those drill instar- mm-hmm. sergeants at AIT. So fucking terrifying experience for me cuz when I see that hat mm-hmm. like I'm thinking boot camp and I'm like what the fuck is this? Um she was, she snuck me into her barracks but uh but Oh, where was it going with, with the uh, oh brain fart? Mm-hmm. That's one of those moments. Um, we were talking about AIT. We were talking about uh, A school. Oh. oh, I lost it. I had a it's funny, funniest darn thing. I I had a, a situation where uh, I was at uh, I don't think it was Camp Atterbury, Camp Atterbury, Indiana, for my BNOC, which is our basic non commissioned officers course. They call it something else now. Um, I think they call it ALC now, maybe. But uh, the um, this one, uh, I I was I was studying because you have to study. Mm-hmm. You know, I was studying, and uh, there was this National Guard unit that had occupied these barracks, and uh, these two women came out with beer, and they cracked open a beer, and they're like, "Hey, you want a beer?" I 
Like, yeah, sure. I got my book and I went over there and I started talking with them. I had a beer with them. They're like, hey, we're going out tonight. You want to meet us at whatever bar? I remember it was Private Daphne and Private Pentecost. I remember their names. And uh, I went, we, I think I, I didn't have a car. I don't think I had a rental. But I took someone else's car. You know, we, me and my buddy, we went with these two two girls. And we had fun. Like, you know, I, I'm not so much into the girls as I'm really into having fun. <laughs> like, let's go out to the bar. Let's have fun. And I remember Private Daphne, or uh, Sergeant Daphne, we had, we had fun. And, uh, like, flash forward six months later, I was in Iraq. No, I was in Kuwait. I was in Kuwait. And uh, I was walking to the, the post Burger King. I think I was with my lieutenant. I love the fucking restaurants in Kuwait. And, and I was I was at I was at the Burger King, and I, I look over, and the person in line in front of me, and her name tape on the back of her head says Daphne. I'm like, "Sorry, Daphne." She turns around, she goes, "Hey, New Jersey." <laughs> she didn't remember my <laughs> name, right? Like I was like, "Hey, how you doing?" She's like, oh, yeah, "You're sober now." Yeah, you are too, right? And uh, and then like three months later, I'm in Iraq and I was at Camp Stryker and I'm like I'm standing there I'm like waiting for Chow to open and I look and the, there's a woman you know she has the, the sock bun right and I'm looking and I'm like oh, look and her name tapes is Daphne I'm like sorry Daphne she turns around hey New Jersey like you said I remember small my name. fucking world small yeah. freaking world but she was like a het driver in a in a trans unit so like they're they're going all over the freaking place in Iraq. I had still running in so many times, like in the army, which is way bigger than the Marines. Yeah, that was really freaking weird. That was weird. That was that was fate. You you yeah, told fate know. to go fuck uh, itself. Uh, I actually so one of my um oh, I guess she's a friend, colleague. One of my colleagues is uh Lisa Jaster. So I'm actually I'm working Lisa Jaster is the third ever female uh female um ranger, army ranger. Third ever female who graduated from ranger school. Mm -hmm. And she was also, like, in her late 30s or early 40s when she did it. Damn. So, yeah. I mean, that was that was tough. She she is a tough broad. She actually got recycled six times. She wrote a whole book about it. Um, she had a hard time, like, getting through ranger school. And she was an engineer. Right? So I'll give you the first phase. In, in ranger school, you have Darby phase, mountain phase, and then jungle, uh, swamp phase. And uh, so I think she failed Darby phase three times. The first time. Which like, one's I, Darby? Darby is at camp. Uh, it's at Fort Benning. Well, Fort Moore now. Okay. Right. So there's this wood, woodland phase, mm -hmm. and then you have the mountain phase, and you have the swamp phase. And uh, she failed the first phase three times. And I'll give you the first one because she's an engineer. And, like, all right, how often is she given op orders? Right. Right. Like, so if she screws up her op order, she might get dinged for that and recycled. Right. But she got failed an additional two times and one funny thing she talked about and she's told me is like people were upset like oh you you took a man's place right but like there were like 50 percent of the men dropped out in darby phase any you know like what no one said like you took a man's place you could have done this right i'm actually i'm working on a podcast with her right now um but she uh, i asked her like you know like uh she said to me she said something interesting to me because like she said, like, like she, she's told me that, like, guys, because she's an attractive woman and she's very physically fit. She does CrossFit. She's mm -hmm. done triathlon. She's done CrossFit competitions and won them, you know. She's like an ant. Like, she can pick up, like, three times her body weight, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so if you, if you look at, I think it was called, like, Battlefield. Uh, not Battlefield. Uh, it was, like, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Wildlands. She was actually in a commercial for Tom Clancy's no Ghost shit. Recon Wildlands where she picked up a dude, and she carried this dude while shooting her rifle. Like, all right, I'll say as someone like the Marine Combat uh, Fitness Test, I can't remember what they called mm -hmm. it, uh, the picking up some another human being is fucking hard. That's hard. Like, yeah, absolutely. Fire carry, yeah, yeah, that's hard. I remember I, I – she said to me, like, you know what it is about you? I'm like, what? She was like, you, you just want to have fun. <laughs> like, Who doesn't? I like, <laughs> well, because, uh, like, I was, I, um, <clears throat> I, she's told me, like, she's gotten into, like, she, she can, she's told me, like, she can tell when a guy is, like, hitting on her, you know? Versus just having a normal, yeah. And, um, you know, a couple of, 
I think two months ago. I, I there's this uh, person that I, I don't know what she is. Uh, this thing that has no name, but she lives in Virginia Beach, and occasionally I go down and see her, and I stay at her place. And uh, Colonel Jaster was going to be at uh, at um, Norfolk, and so I wanted to get together with her to read over a script that we were doing for this podcast. So I said to her, like, well, I can go down to this girl's house, and I can, I can, uh, you know, we can work on the script there. <clears throat> and I thought it was kind of weird, like, you're just going to like go to some dude's you know apartment you know you know you don't really know me that well right but you're just going to go to some dude's apartment and i actually asked her about that and she was like well i know that you just you're just fun (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's that's pretty much it like i uh i mean you you, if you know who jake bro is you familiar Mm. with jake bro so Jake Bro is a former missileer in the Air Force. So he was the guy that was in the silos, not in the silo, but in the capsule, you know, where they launched the nuclear missiles. Mm-hmm. And uh, he does a lot of Ukraine content. And uh, I was in Burbank was a couple of a uh, couple of months ago. I was in Burbank. I was actually talking with Netflix about a show, which God knows if that's ever going to happen. Like these people, they just like to talk. Producers just like to talk and talk and talk, right? YouTube, we already would have had it done. You're going to get lunch for free, and we'll see what goes yeah. from there. Yeah. Right. They just like to talk. But uh, I realized, like, hey, I'm in Burbank. You know, I can get a $99 flight on Southwest Las Vegas, where Jake Bro lives. We can get together. We can make some content. So <clears throat> I, I called Jake, and I was like, Jake, you know, hey, I'm in Burbank. Do you want me to come over to Las Vegas? We can get together and make some content. He's like, yeah, let's go. We'll, we'll get together. And we made a couple of videos, you know, together. Uh, and one of the things we did was we went to this Irish pub and there were these four women sitting there yeah, around my age. They're sitting like across from us. And I was like, Hey, come on, come over here. Come on, come hang out with us. You know? And like Jake couldn't get a word in edgewise. Like I'm talking with all these, these four women and we had a great time. Like for two hours, we're drinking, we're talking and they were fun, you know? And they had one of them, like, I think they had like a bridal thing they had to go to and they left <clears throat> they had to leave. And, uh, like, afterwards, Jake was like, how did you do that? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, how, how, did you, how did you get those girls to come over and talk to us? I'm like, well, I, I, just, <laughs> I just did it, you know? And then he started telling me about, like, like dating strategies and stuff like that. I'm like, I don't have a dating strategy. I just, I just talk with people. And I guess, like, I don't know, maybe I just give off this vibe. as like a guy that just, like, like, I'm not trying to get in your pants. I just want to drink and have fun. And, like, that's, that's, uh, I don't know, that, that's, that might be why it's so easy for me to talk to just, just about anybody. You know? way, like, one time, uh, you know, I'm traveling on that government charge card, right? Mm-hmm. So I, uh, you know, I'm there with, uh, I'm in Maryland with a bunch of friends. And uh, one of the guys stationed there, another guy traveled up mm-hmm. with me, another guy's TDY. And uh, there was this group of chicks over, mm-hmm. you know, this is in uh, high to- at high tops in Maryland. Mm-hmm. And I just sent over a, a round of drinks. I was just like, I've never done this before. I'm, again, young, dumb, 22-year-old. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, hey, buy a, a round of drinks for a vet over there. And uh, they just migrated. Yeah. And it was, it was like almost like they just, each one of them found one of us. And we ended up talking and having a great night. We went back to their place, chilled. I fall asleep at the drop of a hat. Like I was in first time went to out to Katum, you know, and I'm in full fucking battle rattle. I've got my fucking flak on and all that shit. I I dropped my pack. I still have my fucking flak and my weapon, and I just laid down on one of those dirty, no. infested mattresses, and I fell asleep. Hmm. Like so, it takes nothing for me to to conk out. Um, but yeah, amazing time. It was just I don't know. A lot of people think that you have to you know be suave and you have to be Mr. James Bond or some shit. And it's like no, dude, just talk. Like the issue I think a lot of people have is the icebreaker. So, you know, yes, round of drinks for an entire, you know, fucking eight groups of eight size person group mm-hmm. of women. And, and it's like, okay, cool. We'll go talk to them. I don't know. They didn't have to come talk to us or whatnot, but they did. And somehow, despite all being military men, um, <laughs> most of us held their manners together. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know. It doesn't take much. No, I don't know. I, I've always, my, my dad, you know, Irish, right? You can talk the devil out of a golden spoon. I used to say, I can talk the devil out of a golden spoon. And I, I, I still don't understand the meaning of that. Like, 
Why does the devil have a golden spoon? <laughs> why does the devil <laughs> want a golden like, spoon? Why does he? <laughs> but I guess I, you know, I just have this gift of being able to just just talk to people. I don't know. I, uh, you know, I, I when I was uh, at the my flight here got delayed, and uh, I went to the Admiral Lounge for the uh, for uh, American Airlines. I just walked right in. I said hi. I sat down. It's only supposed to be for first class and like people who have admiral memberships. I don't know what it is. Like I can just talk my way into freaking situations. I don't know. But I also, whenever I fly, I usually wear a sport coat. And I think that's uh, like you looked like you looked like you were meant for business today when you arrived. So for those watching, uh, uh, yeah, the camera's on him right now. So you came in with this like I, I this. Cute little sport coat, like yeah. fucking light colored. Like you looked like you were on a walk on a tropical island, but not just <laughs> like you were there to buy some real estate on that island too. Not just like you were there to visit. You belonged. Yeah, I I uh, I try to I try to dress nice whenever I fly. It just seems like you, you tend to get treated better. And also, like I have to go to again, I have to go to Tampa and I have to go to a meeting, and so I brought some ties. So I and people will travel in that because it's easier to do that than to fold it up and keep yeah. it from getting wrinkled. Yeah, because you uh, don't. Because I the the shirt I I actually I brought a seersucker jacket, and I actually when I when I moved down to Washington D.C. I had two suits, you know, like one for the first interview, one for the second interview. Like that's you know really a man really only needs. A man can get away with one suit. Charcoal gray. Works for a wedding, works for a funeral, works for a date night, works for a job interview, you know. So I had two suits, charcoal gray and navy, right? So we the charcoal gray to the first interview, then navy to the second interview. And uh, the first place I worked at, you had to wear a suit. So I was like, oh, crap, I got to buy some more suits. And I never used to wear hats. And... When I when I started taking the metro, which is a subway system in Washington D.C., I realized why you needed to wear a, a straw hat, like I'm wearing right now. Well, it gets Washington D.C. is the South, whether you like it or not. It gets it hot. It is the South, and going from the metro to where I was working at the time, like you will be a puddle of sweat by the time you get there. So I was like, man, I need to get a seersucker suit. And all these men were wearing straw hats, so I started wearing a straw hat, you know, because, oh, wow, this thing actually works, right? So that kind of became my thing, seersucker and straw hats. It looks and, good uh, on you, man. Thank you. I still, I mean, I love my, I love my, I love my straw hat. And I, I know, like, in a lot of the YouTube videos I do, like, I'm in a bathrobe and my hair is messed up and I'm smoking a cigarette. And that, that's me, but it's also a character. And it's uh, it's a character that I kind of adopted early on, mainly because when I used to do some of my short videos for YouTube, um, I had to do them before I went to work because I was working at Accenture. I had to mm -hmm. I had to do my video, I had to work out, and then I had to drive to to work. So I was usually in my bathrobe. And that, and a lot of my video, you know, that kind of became my thing. And my hair is messed up, and I'm wearing my bathrobe. And I think a lot of people, uh, that that worked for me because I look like a crazy person. <laughs> I look like some crazy conspiracy theorist, but I'm giving good intel, right? And I think that really helped because what are the Russians going to say about me? Look, this man, crazy man. Like, well, yeah. Well, you know, if I if I rolled in wearing a suit and a tie, like. What are they going to, you know, they can say, oh, he is a CIA shill. He is CIA shill. He is CIA shill. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's actually one way you can tell whether someone has been in the CIA or not. They, they don't say, they never say CIA. They say the agency. <laughs> the company. The company. You know? <laughs> well, they say the agency. I don't, I don't know if they say the company. I've, I've, dated, I've dated a couple of girls who work for the State Department. Like, what do you do? Oh, oh. That, that is the common thing when you when you're dating in Washington D.C. The first question: Who do you work for? Because they want to see where you are in the stratum. It, yeah, you know. Yeah. And like, oh, I work for the State Department. Oh, doing what? Oh, water analysis for. No, you don't. All this right. motherfucker. Now I know who you work for. <laughs> I was in Afghanistan. This motherfucker was talking to me about how he has like these coffee beans, and he showed me his coffee beans and says, "I grow these. I have a little patch in South America that I grow these." And he works for the uh, 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 
what's the development agency? The oh, uh, UNHCR. I don't one, know. one of those. And I realized it was like fucking years later. I was like, God damn it! I was talking to a spook, and I didn't realize it. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And they're really good at what they do. You know, they're really good at what they do. Oh, they are. Yeah. No, I mean, he he fooled me with that little fucking bit of coffee beans. I was, I'm sitting in a fucking skiff, and he fucking shows me those, and I'm like. It didn't hit me. Why the fuck are you in a skiff? Like, what are you doing here? Because we're talking about, you know. You might want to explain a skiff. Uh, secure Centralized Department secure Inflation yeah. Information <laughs> Facility. Yeah. yeah. Like, we're sitting in a classified building. And why is this bean growing motherfucker uh, sitting here talking to me? And he just was always quiet during the meetings. And it didn't hit me until like two years later. So obviously, I would be very bad at counterintelligence because uh, <laughs> it didn't click for me. I've always been scared of elicitation. Like that's you know, as occasionally on LinkedIn, I get I get um, requests for connection with like uh, with incredibly gorgeous women who like well, they work for Pandora and they have a masters from from. Uh, from but they happen to be Iranian. <laughs> well, like no, it's, it's like it's like come on, like I well, know that. No, I I have a fantasy, right? A fantasy because like there are. Um, I, I can't talk in detail about it, but like there are, you know, like things they, it's like this, we know that in these per certain locations mm -hmm. that there are these certain governments that have these certain women that are trying to elicit p things from like the Navy SEALs or the fucking Rangers or whatever, and they're trying to get in with them. And we have reports of like, you know, counterintelligence, like, yeah. you know, figuring it out. And I have a fantasy of being like giving little breadcrumbs, like maybe I'll talk to you, maybe I will. And then it's, you know, you go through your, your night of passion. And then it's like, I'm not telling you anything. There was a uh, former Army colonel. I think he was working for the Air Force just recently in Colorado. Where, like, he was talking with a woman online who was like, tell me what you did in the skiff today, my love. You know? <laughs> like he just, was just that indicted. fucking ham vested just <laughs> Like, oh, my God, dude, come on. Like. I think one of the one of the advantages of being almost fifty is that like look I can see through your charade, <laughs> you know like it's it's like the only woman's talking to me is in her late forties and she probably smokes cigarettes so that's <laughs> you know like that's that's kind of the only and one of the the neat part about living in in Washington D.C. is that you do there are quite a few really intelligent women who aren't you know who never got married and. And uh, they're, they have multiple degrees. They have interesting jobs, and they're they're great first dates. But I've often said, like, I'm like a really good preview to a really bad movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I, I I like I check all the boxes for someone who's like, oh, this is definitely boyfriend material. But you know, I also like I like to smoke. I like to drink. Like, oh, it's it's. You know, it's seven o'clock while I'm in. Like, I don't really feel like going out. You know, so I like, am really good preview to a really bad movie, and I'm set in my ways. Like, I I have one chair. <laughs> like, I have one chair facing my TV in my house because my my old couches and my I got rid of my old couches because uh, like they were like ten years old and there's stains on them from beer and God knows what food. <laughs> like, I have a table, but I never eat at it. Right? Yeah. Like, I have this. I have this big long table, almost as long as this table here, that I bought back when I lived in, in New Jersey, thinking like, oh, well, my family will come over for dinner. They never came over for dinner, you know? So, uh, you know, this table's been following me. I think I've eaten at it like twice, right? But it looks really nice. It's a nice looking table. Yeah. It, it cost me about $1,000 10 years ago. It ties the room together. Yeah, it ties the room <laughs> together, right? And the house I'm in now, like it doesn't quite fit in the dining room. You know, because it's the kitchen. There's the dining room right here. So like, I kind of pushed into the corner. I'm like, well, I'll 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 leave it there. It's a nice decoration. So, honestly, like when I when I make dinner, I might make a steak. What do I do with the steak? Well, I take the steak. I take the broccoli. I take the usually I make steak, bacon, and broccoli. Right, bachelor bachelor chef. Take it take it over to the to the living room. Sit in front of the TV. I'll I'll actually watch YouTube. I, well, you why not? You were talking about your friend uh, going through uh, Ranger School. Yeah, maybe Lisa Jaster. She's maybe, an amazing woman. 
It made me think of this uh, story. So my friend was in the Air Force. He had mm-hmm. to go through SEER school because he's in the Air mm-hmm. Wing and all that shit. And he, so he goes through SEER school, and they're doing the the you know the capture part, right, where you get set out into mm-hmm. the wilderness after you've learned everything, and you yeah. go out. And this guy goes out, and he finds this pile of bear shit, right? Okay. And he's like, I'm going to – because they have the dogs they're using to hunt, hunt them. Yeah. So he's like, I'm going to cover myself in bear shit and cover up my scent. So I'm going to climb up in this tree. And he climbs up in this tree, and he's covered his entire fucking self in yeah. this shit, this bear shit. And they find him immediately. Oh, wow. And he climbs down out of the tree, and they say, what the fuck are you covered in? And he says, I, I covered myself in bear shit, Sergeant. Yeah. And they're like, there are no bears in Texas. And it was dog shit. Oh. It was fucking a pile of like some great Dane or some shit had gone through this trail and covered it and taken it in the dump. And uh, he got pink eye and all kinds of stuff. And it was absolutely wild. <clears throat> I, there was this guy, <laughs> Thorpe, I think his name was, Thor, Tully, Thor, Thor. I don't know, some Norwegian name. He was, he was one country. I remember we were, uh, <clears throat> we were on the range, and he's like, yo, Macbeth, you got a pine fly in your back. I'm like, you know the genius and species? <laughs> you got a red-headed cockle-belly pine fly in your back. It's a female. It's pregnant. It's going to have babies. You want to put a little plate of milk out for it? Like, what the? How do you know the freaking genius? You got a bug in your back. That's all you got to say. Like, you got a bug in your back. Oh, thanks. You know, brush it off for me. You got a point. You got a red-headed cockle-belly pine fly in your back. There are some country, like, <clears throat> there are some it, it, what's kind of weird is you do meet people of all when you're in the military you meet people of all different types you know uh, when i went to basic training we had uh one guy who was blood and one guy who was a crip and this was in the 90s when they were feuding and the drill sergeants were like afraid these guys were gonna like on the range them. like 86 each other yeah, yeah and they were like nah man like we got we got out we we left la so we wouldn't have to deal with that anymore we don't want to bang how'd they know anymore. I guess they just knew. Huh. I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, the, the, uh, you know, one of the ways we could tell Sunni from Shia is you put them in a prison cell together and the Sunni and Shia will separate themselves. You know, I guess they just knew. Somehow they just knew. I actually, my drill sergeant was from LA. So, uh, yeah, right. Sergeant Ricks, he was from LA and one of our other drill sergeants was from LA. So yeah, they just, they just knew somehow. Yeah, that's crazy shit. Well, hey man, it's been great talking to you, dude. Oh, uh, we're done. I, I can I keep mean, going. I I can keep going. I I think. I think Kyle is worried that I'm going to steal all the content, but uh, it was great talking to you, dude. Thank I you really so appreciate. Much. It. No, Thank absolutely. you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate having you, brother. Hey. Hey. Cheers. Have a great night, man. Double. And thank you all for uh, tuning in. And uh, oh, you have. I know you brought some t-shirts for the team mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So if you want to get the cameras on over there, if you want to give a shout out, let, uh, let them know. So yes, this was, where is the camera? It's right over there. Mm-hmm. So bunker branding, which is the, the company that does my t-shirts, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, the USS Carney was in the red sea and these guys, they should win defensive player of the year. They've shot down over 55 Houthi drones and missiles since uh since the war started and uh bunker branding uh they sent uh t-shirts to the uss carney and uh they actually brought a couple of t-shirts for the team here so yeah head on over to bunker Branding and get yourself a ryan Macbeth t-shirt to help support the channel what's the name of the captain of that that ship i actually I, do not know a, the captain of dude, that ship <laughs> there's a dude that is like on twitter all the time captain hill the USS Eisenhower. I actually, I toured the USS Eisenhower. I have a selfie with him. I made a video with him where I asked him, how do you sign for an aircraft carrier? <laughs> like, how do you sign? I assume you get a document like this. It's well, like... he said, well, the different departments sign for their stuff, and then I sign the, you know, the, the, the major. Departments. Yeah, yeah. Got their stuff. But, like, you know, imagine, like, signing for two nuclear reactors. Okay, sign, you know, yes, we have two nuclear reactors. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, that was the question I asked him. Like, look, when I was in the army, you had to sign for your nods and your weapons, and you you know, have all these hand receipts. How do you sign? Can you imagine the hand receipt for a nuclear freaking carrier? Oh, I'm sorry, Kyla. So this motherfucker, this lieutenant, one time, mm -hmm. it was it was we're getting ready to like do a deployment and all that mm -hmm. stuff, and so we're taking inventory of everything. We're taking over with us to Ramadi, mm -hmm. and we do the the like we're like we're gonna get this done, and we do it. We we check everything. And we, we sign it off. This is one of those moments of like, fuck me, the military, man. Is we went through all the hassle of mm -hmm. checking everything. And we, we said, sir, we have it. We checked everything. This is X, Y, and Z. It's yeah. there. He made us go. Like, everyone got out early because we're about to do a pump. Yeah. And, and then he made us do it again. We lost that fucking free day off. Like, they did morning PT mm -hmm. and they let everyone else go. And that lo boot Louie was like, nah, we're doing it again. I don't trust you guys. Fuck you. Well, well, you know, trust but verify, right? He probably got screwed before. He know, was, I, I don't know about that. I, it was his first duty station. I retired. Station. <laughs> like, I, I, gave, I went to my supply sergeant with, like, three boxes. Like, three, like, freaking huge uh, boxes of crap that I had. Because I joined in 94. So I had, like, stuff that like, was issued, like, during Vietnam right like a compass case that was olive green you know <laughs> like stuff like that you know and it was like it was like christmas for the supply sergeant because like you know he can like oh you know can't do you know what an insect bar is no i didn't either so like on my hand receipt there was this thing called insect bar and it, it was on my hand receipt for like 20 freaking years you know insect bar like what the hell is this? It sounds like something like you know, like oh, you it's like, like a bar a, like that a, you put like like a deodorant stick of for insect repellent. Yeah, it's a mosquito net. Because I was gonna like, oh, so I'm sorry, sir, I don't have the insect bar, right? And he's like, yeah, it is right here. He picks up the freaking mosquito net. Like that's the freaking insect bar. <laughs> Wait, you don't like turn it in every duty station? You, uh, it depends on. It de there's some like you might get some stuff from CIF. Or some stuff from the Rapid Fielding Initiative. And okay, like, because like for us, it was like you go to SIF and then you're changing duty stations. You turn everything back, everything back into SIF, and you go with your like all you have are your uniforms, and that's mm -hmm. it. And then you fuck off to the next place and and do that. Well, also, like dude, if you if you over twenty years, you collect a lot of freaking gear. You know, someone lo loses something, you find something in the back of the truck. Hey, who's whose poncho is this? Nobody. All right, well. My favorite thing, freaking mine now. My favorite thing were the Oakleys. Like you get the Oakleys, you get the knives and all that stuff. And they're like, we don't want the knife back. We don't want this. But then I get, I go to Marsoc, and they're like, we want the straight blade back. You can keep the switchblade, but we want the straight blade back. I, I have no idea why. I can't fathom. Wait, you should do a switchblade. Yeah. Oh my God. It was a Gerber. It was an amazing. It was. It's like that, that yeah. thick, mm -hmm. and it was this wonderful Gerber. Like when we cut open, you know, the water pallets that they issue they send over there yeah like you had to be careful because that thing would slice through every bottle on the way down it's amazing oh it was wonderful but they also gave it a fucking uh a fixed blade and i don't know why they wanted the fixed blade so bad versus the gerber which was astronomically more expensive than the uh i don't know that's that's an interesting i know when we were returning from iraq there was a national guard unit that was going through because the, the Navy does the customs, like they inspect all your stuff to make mm -hmm. sure you're not bringing back like grenades or whatever, right? And uh, this dude, like he put a grease gun like on the customs table and they're like, well, we need your paperwork for the trophy. And like, no, this is, this is my issued weapon. They had to go get the property book out. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> this grease gun. So the M, M, M thing is called the M3 grease gun. This, this is a weapon from like World War II. 45, I don't even think 45 caliber ammunition is in the inventory anymore. But just on, on the property the... book, so the guard brought it. Yeah. So <laughs> they thought it was a trophy, like a war trophy. Like we need to see the paperwork. Because you're only allowed to bring back two trophies, right? Like tank commander has to approve it. I, I had a box get fucked for like something that looked like a round. It was like some hollowed out round. I don't know. It might have, it might have been like a bottle opener that had been carved out around uh, and they yeah. fucking dug everything out. Yeah. Customs, man. Just let me take a few teeth in a few years, you know? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk. I know you're going you're gonna to have a busy day with them tomorrow, but it's been great talking to you, buddy. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Kyla, you can cut it whenever you want.